Good evening, everyone. Welcome to all. Uh, sorry for the late start. We had a very um, high protein finance committee meeting just now, which necessitated a few minutes of break in between the previous and this one. Um, just to go over a couple of technical um, points again, when you're not speaking, if you could please mute your microphone and uh, I'm, I don't believe there's anybody phoning in, but um, uh, so I won't bother with, uh, oh, I take that back. There is one phone. Um, so star six to mute on the phone and star six to unmute. And I, I guess, um, Keith, please correct me if I, if I mess this up, but star nine to raise your hand. Um, is that correct? Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, great. Okay. So 2.2, um, public comments. And if I might ask, um, those of you who wish to make comments, uh, members of the public, if you could please uh, click first on the participants, if you're not familiar with Zoom, and then on the raise hand icon um, that comes up at the bottom of the participants rectangle. Um, that would be very helpful. Um, so I have a hand raised from uh, Drew Jenkins. Please go ahead. Hello, I want to uh, make a statement for a teacher at U32. My name is Drew Jenkins. I'm the math code department head and I've been a part of the U32 family for four years. During these times of COVID, we have been doing the best to take care of our families and best support our communities. One of our long standing faculty members has been put in an unfair position by our superintendent. She lives in a household where she, where her significant other has a immune, is immune compromised. In order to protect her family, she decided to work remotely through VTVLC. When we could not find a teacher to step into her classroom to teach, she selflessly volunteered to teach her students at U32 remotely. Together, her and the building principal worked to protect her and her family during the pandemic, as well as support her students' learning. Even with this compromise, the superintendent overruled and gave this value member of our learning community the choice between reporting to school for in-person instruction or taking unpaid leave. This put her in a difficult position, either going to school and risk passing on COVID to her significant other, which could be deadly, or not receive her salary or health benefits, which in turn also puts her family at risk. I know this community values being there for one another. This teacher not only did what was best for her family by volunteering to teach remotely, but she continued to support our school community as well. Being told to teach in person and risk her family's well being or face the consequences has alienated one of our beloved members in our school community. Making someone choose between providing for their family and protecting them from the virus is not uh, is not how we support each other. And that is all I wanna say. Thank you, Drew. Um, I should just specify that um, in public comments where uh, the board is not gonna engage in, in sort of a back and forth dialogue, but we're, we're taking note and we'll, um, we'll consider the public comments in the proper place in the meeting. Um, so I, I see Julie Kiefer, please. Um, Julie, are you muted? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, I have a statement to make. Um, I'm Julie Kiefer and I am code department chair. Thank you, Drew, for your statement. And um, I am just starting my 24th year teaching math at U32, and I have always been a proud employee of Washington Central. Had I not been able to work for VTVLC this year, I would have been faced with the same decision as Kathy, go back to school in constant fear of my health, or in Kathy's case, family health, or take a leave of absence. As a veteran teacher in this district, district, we have never done things this way. We take care of each other, always making personal our personal well-being of the community a priority. 
asking an excellent teacher, excellent math teacher, and a colleague who has been fully committed to our students in U32 for many years to make this impossible decision will be a precedence that will be hard to overcome as a community, impacting morale and confidence in our leadership in the central office. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, note taken, once again. Uh, so uh, Drew and Julie have, um, have spoken. Uh, are, there, are there other members of the public who would like to weigh in at this point in the meeting? I should, I should note that there is another opportunity for public comments after the um, agenda item six and before an executive session that the board will be doing. Um, so with that, I, I see that Madeline Doherty has, um, has raised her hand, followed by Cara, please. Thank you. Um, unlike my colleagues, I do not have a, a fully prepared statement, um, but I wanted to speak in solidarity with, with my colleagues. Um, I firmly believe that right now we have to take care of each other and U32 was ready to do that. Um, I feel that it was really a, a responsible and the right thing for our administration to give Kathy the opportunity to teach remotely from home and to serve the school community in that way. And to see that possibly undermined um, is really upsetting to me because I moved to Vermont to take a job at U32 in part because I was so impressed with the administration and the commitment to taking care of each other as teachers, taking care of our community. And I really saw that shining through when the pandemic first hit. I was really proud of how our school handled it. And um, I hope that the school board will support our administration and our teachers in doing what they need to do to protect themselves, our kids. Um, meaning our students and our personal families and um, to make it through this really difficult time together. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. We, we appreciate that. Um, Cara Rosenberg, please. Hi, um, it's nice to see members of the board. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I am here also to express solidarity with my colleagues. Um, I think that we've had a lot of discussions between, um, I'm, I teach in the high school, I'm, I teach at the high school and I have also negotiated, um, been part of the negotiating team for the last two uh, rounds. Um, I think that we've had lots of conversations between the board and the teachers about morale and about, and, and I feel like that I've always heard heard and seen like the board really valuing that and valuing the morale of their teachers and, and really wanting the teachers to know that they feel respected and valued. And I know that um, we all appreciate that, um, especially when it comes to things like negotiations, which are, you know, by default, quite fraught. Um, I, I worry and I wonder when I think about like things about questions I could ask, I wonder what the impact on morale and on student learning it is of, of, of pushing of, you know, not allowing this person who expected to be able to do this um, to, to teach remotely because of her health. Um, I, I wonder, I wonder what the advantage is. I wonder like who's not ahead there. Um, I also wonder what the message is, what the message we send to students and families when we do this. If we say out of one side of the mouth that we respect, you know, the, the people in our community and their health, but then out of the other side of our mouth, then we're not doing, we're not, you know, practicing what we preach. I really worry about that um, because that's when I see organizations sort of falter. And I, you know, I applied to U32 three times before I got a job here and I'm very pleased to work in this district. And I've always felt, um, even when I've disagreed with things, I have always felt pretty respected by the board and the administration and my colleagues um, and, I, and, and I value that and I wanna continue that and I want us to see us to have an organization that can uh, exist in mutual respect, um, which I feel like we're making like, we've done a lot of work in this district on in the last couple of years. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kara. Um, are there others? Oh, oh may, I, um, may I ask those of you who have spoken, who clicked on the raise hand, to uh, click once more just to unraise your hand. I, I get easily confused, I'm afraid. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, is, are, are there others, um, other members of the public who would like to uh, say anything, make a statement or pose a question that we can deal with later in the, um, in the meeting? Okay, um, well, uh, that came through loud and clear, I think. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on then. Um, oh, i getting ahead of myself. Um, Daniel, please. Uh, two, two points, if it's okay to make it. Um, one point is, uh, I uh, though I also don't have any uh, pre-prepared speech, I would like to just uh, place the same statement of solidarity. Um, also, I've noticed that we're meeting online today, and I wanted to open up my classroom as an opportunity. I have 18 seats available, um, and since we fit 18 people, actually 20 people in this room, I just wanted you all to feel welcome as a board to use my room since it's available to you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, understood. And uh, we appreciate your invitation. Um, moving on to uh, agenda revisions. Um, do we have any? Oh, uh, Lindy, please. I just, um, in response to Daniel, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I would love for us to be meeting in, parts, in person, but I'm noticing um, at the bottom, there's 71 people participating in this meeting. And it would we couldn't do that and have the public participating unless they were all calling in by Zoom. So I think my I would love to have us meeting in person in a space large enough, but because it's a public meeting and it has to be open and we never know exactly how many people could show up. Um, usually it's none, but obviously tonight on the last few nights because of or the last few meetings because of COVID, we have had more participation. Um, that I don't think it'd be possible for us to meet in person yet. Thank you, Lindy. Um, are, are there any agenda revisions? It sounds as though, oh, Jonas. Scott, um, I wonder if we might um, uh, add a discussion about what we've just heard in the public comments to the executive session. Um, I have, we're not able to take any action um, because action would have to be warned. But Certainly. Adding it, um, adding it to discussion, sure. That would be the appropriate place for it. Yep. Great. Thank um, you. You're very welcome, thanks. So um, any other agenda revisions before we shine the spotlight on Towns. Towns. You're on. Awesome. Um, so obviously, in the last few weeks, the last few weeks have been very eventful um, for everyone in, in our community. Starting with uh, two weeks ago, um, Meet Your TA Night happened, which is um, where upcoming seventh graders have the opportunity to finally meet with uh, their TAs who will they, be, they will be spending their entire U32 career with, um, which I imagine was uh, that for a upcoming uh, rising class that where everything seemed uncertain, um, at least I know that it was appreciated by uh, seventh graders as a way of easing them into a very, very unique and, and scary school year. And then a week after that, uh, was the start of school. That means that it was the start of uh, virtual classes for 11th and 12th graders and in-person classes for um, seven through 10. Um, and then uh, the week after that was the start of in-person classes for 11th and 12th and then uh, nine and 10 went remote while well, the middle school stays all the way through. This week also had um, Lots of, I guess, normal start of school events done a little bit uniquely, like Picture Day, um, which we uh, had on Monday. 
and um, sports also got started in their own unique way uh, with varying safety requirements on safety measures set forth for each sport. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. I know lots of people who are involved and who are really excited to um, get back into the groove with that. As a whole, it was like speaking personally as a student, um, this week so far has been a little bit hectic. Um, and it's been really, really, it's been really great to see everyone and to um, see all my teachers. Um, and it's been, I think that in a lot of ways, the adjustment um, has been really well handled uh, by the uh, people, by the administration and by our teachers um, in a way that I think is, it, it it's an easier adjustment than I thought it would be. And I think that's a sentiment that I, I hear from a lot of my fellow students. There is still some worry from students, um, especially uh, there are health concerns that, uh, that I know students have, but overall, I think that it was a, a very successful start of school and I was uh, really happy to be a part of it. Excellent, thank you, Towns. Um, board member questions? for towns if i could maybe start um towns by by asking is it too early for you to be able to get a sense of how the transitions are between the um online weeks and the in school weeks um i think it's i can i have a general sense i'd say i think that um Teachers are still adjusting to the use of Canvas, and that is a relatively new system for a lot of teachers. Um, and it really is different class by class as far as um, I'd say the ease of use that um, it represents in different classes. And I think that some classes are uh, lean more towards being virtual while others uh, function better in person. Um, and I think that tr these transition times are going to be complicated, but I, I think that judging from what I've seen so far, they are um, within faculty's ability and students' ability to uh, handle and adjust to. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, other questions for for towns, or should we give him a break for now? Um, may I ask um, Brian, with your permission, if I may ask Stephen Dellinger Pate about his um, uh, search for uh, an under uh, an eleventh grader to um, to be Towns's partner. Yep. So yes. we, yes. So we put out um, the uh, the call for a junior and I've had a few students respond. I will have to get towns together with a small committee. As you remember, we had a little interview with those candidates last year, um, what seems like an eternity ago when we got towns. Um, but uh, we will have our new person in place by the next board meeting. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's great news. Um, good. Um, and we can move on to 3.1 superintendent's report. 3.1.1 um, school opening. And I guess from there, Brian, you can just run with it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, so uh, again, I, I'm just going to piggyback off of what Towns said. I think Towns uh, kind of uh, captured it. It's been a very, uh, at the last few weeks, had been very eventful. Uh, their teachers are doing an exceptional job in the classroom. Uh, the uh, administrators, leadership team, our ESP members have all been just doing uh, fabulous work uh, with reopening our schools. Uh, I, and I also uh, just uh, uh, before our meeting today, I did pull the uh, attendance, the daily attendance, the average daily attendance rate and uh, the overall district average attendance of all of our schools. And this includes our remote learning school. 
uh, is 97.3%. So uh, it's great that we reopened. A large majority of our kids are in school. Uh, it, and I would say that uh, someone who's done uh, a lot of work uh, in uh, you know, the, looking at the data, the, one of the big attendance numbers, when you hit that 97%, it's a sweet spot. Uh, and so we're above the 97 percentile right now. And I think the district, uh, again, should just be very proud of the work that everyone has been doing uh, with regards to this. Um, I do have the individual schools as well, that they're all very good, all very high. Uh, Berlin Elementary is 97%. Calis is at 98.3%. Doty is at 96.01%. Uh, East Montpelier is at 97.52%. Uh, Romney is at 95.38%. U32 is at 97.83%, and uh, the uh, remote school is at 95.42%. So the schools should all be very proud of themselves. The kids are there, they're coming, they want to be there, and I think that just shows it right there. So uh, uh, I think that says a lot. Um, the, there are, of course, other things a lot. We have an action packed agenda tonight to talk about. We have, uh, uh, there are some challenges, of course, with reopening, and we are chasing some moving targets. Uh, I know we have uh, some, we have a conversation later on about the uh, finance, and and uh, we just came out of our finance committee, and there's a lot of information there. Uh, we also have some updates regarding class size, which is uh, and we'll get into that next. Uh, but one of the uh, big things is looking at the class size document that was given uh, to the board in the board packet. Uh, it gives you an idea of all the classes in the entire district uh, that are. Uh, that and all the configurations in every school and how they're being filled. Uh, so we have a wide variety of numbers of students and classes. Uh, I know in uh, Vermont, uh, we pride ourselves on having um, small class sizes, right? That's uh, that's kind of uh, like, I know it's, uh, it's almost the saying it's as American as apple pie, right? Uh, Vermont and small class sizes is definitely a, a big thing. The um, uh, one of the challenges, of course, right now is the remote school. Uh, we have uh, pretty good numbers in, in most of the classes that are uh, uh, that kind of compare to uh, uh, many of the other configurations across the district, except in uh, grades three and four and, uh, and in grades five and six. I do know that in grades five and six, we started out uh, the, la the last time we were looking at these numbers, they were close to 29 or 30. Now it's down to 24. So there's still some fluctuation there, but the grades three and four uh, information, uh, it, the, the, it's, it's at, I think it's around 30, it could be even be going to 31. Um, and so um, again, it's only the second week of school. We're still looking at those numbers uh, that we looked at some considerations of what we could do. Uh, one of the ideas that were float, was floating out there was hire another teacher, which could be uh, something that we could do. Uh, the, the issue with that is we're, it's a, we're unsure of the budget impact. Uh, right now, we're, we're hopeful that the budget's going to be good, but the legislature doesn't end, we believe, until September 25th on or around there. So we should have some information about how some of the funds that we've requested for reimbursement uh, for reopening school will come in. And, but if it doesn't come in, then we would have to consider taking it from the surplus or from some other, some other place. And so. Uh, that was one of the challenges with, with that idea of hiring. Um, the other piece is the, uh, or do we try to see if there's a, low, a, a class in the district uh, and this becomes tricky. Uh, do, we, do we have a class with such a low number that we can move a teacher into teaching one of the, uh, into alleviating, uh, for example, the grade three, four uh, numbers. Uh, and that also presents some challenges because the um, numbers uh, I mean, where, who, who do you pick, right? Who do you, who do you want to have go in, into that class from the elementary schools? Uh, and so that becomes a, a challenge, right? So that, that's where we're at. So it, right now we're just kind of uh, chasing the moving target. Again, we're only in the second week of school. And so um, you know, I, I don't know if the board wishes to have a discussion about this. I do know that uh, I've received a lot of uh, um, concerns from some of the parents and some of the teachers about the sizes of the remote classes. However, um, we are under, uh, I, I've also looked up the, uh, the there are, there's no state statute that says there has to be a certain class size. Uh, we still don't know where the budget's gonna land. And as of right now, the, the recommendation 
that I've been putting forth is uh, let's see how this plays out over the next few weeks uh, as if, to see if these numbers change uh, one way or the other so we can make a more informed decision. Great. Thank you, Brian. Do you want to catch your breath and we'll see if board members have any questions for you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, board member questions. Caroline. Thanks. I'm just curious if um, there's any information on the impact of student learning and how the numbers in a remote classroom, uh, what is the impact of that? Um, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head around what I don't know enough about remote learning to really have an answer. And I'm just wondering, I guess, one, if if that has if there is an answer to that and to what you're using to gauge what that impact is and where would the threshold be um any information on any of that would be helpful thanks so i mean that's a great question i mean what does the research say I and mean, we can do a, we can definitely look for the additional research about remote learning and the size of classes uh, I'm, I'm sure you can find different things from different people. I do uh, say that, uh, I don't know if you've heard of a, a philosopher uh, named Malcolm Gladwell. Are you, are you familiar with him? Uh, he's a, a modern day philosopher and he wrote a, a book and I can probably share the chapter with, with, the, with the board uh, entitled, uh, entitled David and Goliath, right? It's a little book here. And basically it's a story of uh, David and Goliath and the, and that basically we've all been we've all heard the story of David and Goliath and how they came out and fought each other. And we know that David slew Goliath and it was a big, big uh, shock to everyone when uh, David, when David won. But when you go and the whole book is about uh, what people think and what versus what possible realities are. Uh, and so, for example, when, uh, you, when Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in chapter one about you know David and Goliath and how everyone thought Goliath was the uh, you know, was picked to win he was how could he lose but when it when the scientists and researchers actually did do uh, the, the uh, study on it they found out that uh, David could shoot a rock with pinpoint precision 50 yards away and at, at 90 miles an hour and so that's how he beat Goliath and so even though we've always been told that the story of David and Goliath is uh, one where Goliath wins uh, should win and doesn't uh, what's interesting is the second chapter of this book, and the reason why I bring it up to you, Caroline, uh, is it talks about class sizes, and it talks about uh, the sizes of classrooms, and is it, uh, we all all have been thinking about class sizes as this like holy grail, right? Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not an advocate for uh, increasing class sizes at all, but I'm just saying that there is, uh, there are stories out there where folks who do take a, um, who do, uh, uh, we can't automatically assume that a small class size is all actually the best thing for kids. Sometimes you get less children in the class. Sometimes you get to a certain number in a classroom where it actually takes away from discussions, takes away from kids learning from each other. Uh, and you know, it's an interesting, I, I'll send it over to the board, uh, the chapter two, so you can see it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the, it's the leading word on everything, but it gives a different perspective on something that I know we're, we're considering. Uh, especially with remote learning. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, that you're doing your part to educate the board, Brian. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, Chris, then Diane, then Lindy, please. Um, hey, Brian, um, can you explain or, or describe what the specific concerns um, of the teachers have been in terms of the class size issue and what the specific concerns uh, that the parents have expressed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the uh, specific concerns I've heard is uh, from parents. It's been difficult for the teacher. Um, uh, it's it's been difficult because there's so many more kids in the classroom. Uh, it's difficult for the children to see each other um, uh, in the in the room. Uh, I know, like right now, I'm looking at a screen of. Uh, 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 25 people, but there's more than 25 people here. But and so there, there are some things with that in that regards. I know that there are some things that are, are not are, are easier in it. But you don't have to worry about kids going to the bathroom and things like that uh, during 
Uh, you don't have to worry about writing passes and everything else because they're at home, but it, but it is a different experience for the teacher. And I think the teachers, especially for the teacher who has a larger class size, it's more, more kids than, than what folks have been used to. Um, there was a concern about uh, some, uh, one of the parents had uh, expressed a concern about equity or uh, saying that her child's in a classroom with, with a, in a larger classroom. Um, yeah, even though we do have the option to offer uh, in, in school, uh, in, you know, live, live on location uh, classes. So uh, there, there, those are a lot of the different things I've heard currently. Uh, doesn't mean I won't hear more, uh, but that, that's really a lot of the uh, concerns that I've heard. Have any of the teachers expressed the concern about being able to effectively teach uh, that larger number of students in a remote environment? I think I think I think uh, I think the one of the teachers that has expressed it. Yes, uh, I did. I, there is there is a concern from one of the teachers that this could be this is different and it's more difficult for them. Thank you. Thanks. So Diane, then Lindy, then Jill. Um. So. I certainly um, know that there aren't any legal statutes, but we in Vermont have had a variety of quality standards that have talked about class size and looking at that. So that's there's a reason for that rule of thumb or that work toward that. And I realize that there are different times when things change. I do think if we had a physical classroom of 31 children, we would be looking at how do we shift that a little yeah. bit. And so um, given, I mean, remote learning, it has its challenges because it's just not our second nature yet. I, I hesitate to also compound it with um, a larger class size and just would hope that we would apply some of the same thinking of what, as Caroline was saying, what's the impact, what's the best option, and and the reality of if we keep the kids in the center of it, really, what is it that we need to do that's the best for the kids and figuring out from there. We, we're already, um, we're trying our best not to have to compromise a lot of great teaching and experiences for our kids who have a variety of the options of in-person or remote, um, so we don't, we don't want to lose that from having that impact of a bulge in one of the classrooms. Yeah. And, and Diane, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, one of the other thing is it's also new for a lot of the teachers. So it's even, it's even harder, you know, I mean, it's even just harder in, in general doing something new such as remote teaching. I know that. Uh, and so I, I definitely understand where the teachers are coming from. Thanks very much. Um, Lindy, then Jill, then Floor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we also have to take into consideration the younger the children, the more the parental involvement is quite often. And in Vermont, we have uh, robust parental involvement. I say that as an educator who's taught in other states too. And um, so you're not just dealing with 30 to 31 third and fourth graders sounds unreasonable to me. Um, and I had a first grade class with 26, but it wasn't in Vermont and it wasn't with as many emails. We didn't have email then. Um, and expectations of an answer and responses. And I'm not at all saying it's bad that we have parent involvement. I think it's wonderful. I'm just saying you're taking into account not only are you managing 31 kids, their papers, their work, you're also managing the parents and this whole remote. I'm currently a remote teacher for a cohort, which was a surprise. And um, it is it is a different management system and Canvas is a new platform. I'm using Seesaw where I used Google Classroom last year, just learning the platforms that's a lot of learning and a lot of management. And I think we need to try and figure out how to um, look at the situation with eyes of how do we make this work for the teacher and the families. And uh, Lindy, I can just uh, also say that, uh, yeah, in other states, not in Vermont, it's not uncommon to have 20, 25, 30 kids in a class. Uh, and I know in Vermont, and, and I think you make a good point about parent and parent involvement. You're not just 
working with uh, students, 29, 30 students, you're working with 29 to you know, 60 parents, uh, depending on, uh, so, so I, mean, I definitely think it's a good point. I, I just think that, you know, right now we're in the uh, second week of school um, and the numbers have been fluctuating. I mean, they have been fluctuating in those classes and we're not sure where it's gonna land. Um, so, and, and we also don't know where the budget's gonna land with the uh, district, uh, with the state. Uh, and so, you know, that's why um, I, I definitely think we need to continue to look at this. We meet weekly uh, with, uh, we have a remote learning administrative team that we, we meet weekly. We look at the, uh, what's, what's possible. Uh, and, you know, I know everyone wants an answer immediately, uh, which is always, uh, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't blame the parents because, you know, that's their babies. I get it. Um, uh, I, I just want to make sure that the district is, um, uh, if I, I, what I've been telling folks is we end up hiring a, a teacher or two teachers extra now, not knowing what the budget could mean if we just wait a few more weeks. That could mean losing more than two teachers to make up for it next year, depending on how, how bad or how, how uh, tough this deficit, if, we, if we're, we're not sure what's, where it's going to land. I mean, we've heard some good things, and Lori will talk about that in the financial report, but you know, I, I, it's... You know, I know that we've been told that today's September 16th and the legislature gets is supposed to convene no later than September 25th. And I wasn't necessarily advocating for hiring, but looking oh, okay. at all um, avenues of numbers and where people are and oh. how personnel is being used. So be creative. Okay. Great. Thanks, Lindy. Jill and then Floor. Jill, um, you're muted. Oh, you're on the phone. Uh, remember star six? Hmm. Hey, can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. Okay, yeah, I was actually on the Zoom, but I kept my video off knowing the internet is bad today. Um, uh, so I, I'm just curious, Brian, have you, actually laid out what uh, some possible solutions to this would look like if we felt like it was a problem to solve and what those specifically what those would cost. I, you know, I'm feeling like we're, we're probably going to have to make a decision about this with uh, inadequate data since we don't have good evidence on class size and remote learning and we're not going to <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so it, it would be I would find it helpful to have something uh, you know, laid out for us um, so that we could make a decision. And then just in terms of the legislature, um, they are moving through the budget fast and a lot of the decisions have already been made. So unless there's big controversy about what the House did in the Senate, and perhaps there is, um, it's it's not likely to be substantially different when they adjourn from what the House passed. Yeah, so so I, I understand what you're so what you're saying, Jill, is uh, what are some decisions, right? So uh, I think it comes down to, uh, you know, I think there's uh, three ultimate options, right? We hire, but we don't know how many teachers we need to hire if we want to hire. That's option I think number one. Option two is we identify some classrooms in the district that have lower numbers, and we move kids and reconfigure the kids in those classes to accommodate the children in the remote classes. Or number three. We, we wait until we see what the number is actually going to be as the numbers continue to fluctuate, uh, just as this is only the second week of school. Uh, I mean, I think those are the three options that we have. If there's other options, uh, I, I, some parents did say maybe we can reconfigure and look at reconfiguring the uh, grade levels in the remote learning. Uh, I thought that was an interesting idea, but um, when you start getting into, when you think about elementary school in general, uh, grade three, and above is when you're reading to learn. Uh, below that, you're learning to read. And so you really don't want to have a, a two, three classroom and, and taking it or, so it's it's very difficult even with the configurations that we have. So those are type, those are some of the options that we could do. Uh, but again, uh, I, I, I think it's only the second week of school. We still have parents moving into the district. We still have some parents leaving the district. Uh, and, uh, there's still some parents who may want to think about going to remote or taking their kids out of remote, saying my kid's gonna go back to a school because we think it's safer than what it was, you know, maybe it's not so bad uh, because 
the data keeps saying that things are continually getting better in Vermont. So it's, it's uh, yeah, again, it's probably not the answer you completely want to hear, Jill, but uh, you know, those are, I think, the options that we have. Okay, um, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jill. So Floor, then Chris, then Jonas. Hi, Brian. I, I guess another point of uh, another option uh, on data that I would love to see is more not about, I'm not as interested about the numbers as the student needs. So what are the student needs for that cohort? Because then that might help you with that decision. And then I am interested not to put that teacher on the spot, but I see that she is on the call. I'm more about sharing the highlights of this week, just like we did with towns and just see how how things went this week and just get some, uh, yeah, you know, just some some idea of how things are on, on the ground. Not, you know, I'm not advocating for another teacher. I'm, I mostly want to know what the student needs are and just how it's going from, you know, somebody that is on the ground, if that's okay. Uh, I, I do not have a, uh, have a problem with that at all. If, if a teacher is here, I, I think I saw her. Kate, are you here? I am here. Yes. Can you hear me? Better okay. day. Sorry to put you in this, but I would just love to hear how how's it going. Since this is new, is this good for us? Good. Um. So it is a a puzzle beyond all puzzles. Um. And I've been a classroom teacher for eleven years. Um. The students are fabulous. They always are, and this group is especially wonderful. Um, the, but I'm not just teaching all day. I troubleshoot tech problems every other minute and try to um, puzzle out what is the best groupings for students. Um, like I would have to do that anyway in a classroom, but um, with 30, it's a bigger puzzle to have to solve. Um, so, but the students are wonderful and um, we are starting to do um, our learning um, as best we can with the large numbers. And um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I'm having fun. <laughs> I always have fun when I'm with the kids and I think they're having fun and we are doing some learning, which feels good. Um, but there's a lot more to the numbers than just educating them. Um, there's very little support in the classroom. I do have one other teacher that comes in occasionally to do things. Um, but as far as if there's a problem with tech, I'm that person who has to solve that tech on the fly, right? Um, so I kind of feel like a one room schoolhouse during the day, right? Because even though there's other adults there as well, they're not familiar with Canvas and I'm maybe a couple weeks ahead of them on that as well. And um, we're finding that the, the tech that we have in different places allows some students to access the learning more than others. So that's part of the, the, the piece that I'm having to the battle with every day for those 30 students. So, but we're having fun and the kids are awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. It sounds as though they're awesome at your house too, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're playing tag. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, Jonas, please. And um, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, Brian, I've Brian, I've I've read Gladwell, and I believe the sweet spot is eighteen to twenty-four. I think I think I I, I recall that. Um, I'm a parent of one of the, uh, my son is a student in the remote three, four, and I just want to give Kate Rob a, a huge vote of confidence, uh, and the administration of the remote school, a huge vote of confidence. Um, you know, my son's experience and our family's experiences, you know, is, is, is not normative. Um, but, uh, uh, it's been, um, it's been, it's been good for, it's been good for him. Um, he's had a good time and, um, you know, I've seen some of the technical challenges that, uh, that Kate is, is talking about. Um, and Kate, I, I wonder if, um, you know, could you talk about sort of the, you know, how the, you know, 
Does the class size, does the large class size exacerbate the technology problems that you're having? Um, and then um, are, are those technology problems around bandwidth and connectivity or are they more around use of the platforms themselves? Um, so the problems have to do with um, bandwidth. They have to do with devices that the students have um, available to them. Um, and they, then that's all compounded by the class size, right? So at, you know, day one, I was, you know, battling 15 different tech issues at the same time. Um, if we can't see and hear each other, right, then it's going to be really hard to learn and build community, right? So that is, the, the class size just compounds it, right? I can break them into smaller groups to try to lessen that issue, and you know, and I do that just to teach specifically. But it, um, yeah, the class size and the tech issues are the two things that I, I battle against the most. I would say right now. Can I, can I ask a, a quick follow-up question? Maybe uh, sure. if, Keith, if maybe if Keith is on, he can answer this as well. Are the problems that you see sort of you know perpetual problems that happen over and over and over again, or are they unique problems? Is there a way to put together a troubleshooting guide that someone like I don't know a parent volunteer might be able to help with you know during a couple hours of a shift one day? So is that for me or for Keith? For both of you guys. So I put something together this weekend that I sent out to my parents that encouraged them to check a bunch of different, it was in my um, parent teacher letter, that encouraged them to A, um, first, um, you know, check their, you know, check with their provider to make sure everything was as current as it cost could possibly be. If they had a problem to email, email IT help. If they even had a problem, um, uh, you know, I also said, if you have like an old device that's, um, got a faster processor and you know better video and audio card to have your kids zoom on that. I even found a resource out of California that gave some ideas about how to improve your Zoom experience by turning off certain things in your house at the same time. So that's what I've done on my end. And I've called parents one-on-one -on -one when I've noticed that their connection has been poor and that their kid, I can't hear their kid and no one can hear their kid um, to say, okay, so here's some ways, let's troubleshoot this and try to fix this, right? So. I've done that on my end, um, but, and I know the district, I know that Keith is there to help, right? But it requires parents, you know, asking for that help from my understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, um, Dorothy. And then um, because Jael hasn't yet had a chance to weigh in, um, we'll do Jael after Dorothy and then um, Jill and Diane. Hi, um, I was just wondering if the, the ratio of struggling students to non-struggling students was roughly the same or, or as, nor, as uh, I guess the in-person schools or what. And I just wondered how that worked in, the, in all these numbers. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't have that information yet, but I can get that to you. Uh, well, I, I don't need it personally. I just wondered how that's affecting the problems uh, that uh, uh, it doesn't need to be a printout of who, how many or whatever. I just thought maybe that's uh, making it a, a tough problem tougher. Well, I know, I, I, thought, I know Gillian, maybe Gillian would like to, I, I, she has been working with the remote if she wants to uh, speak up here. Oh, there she is. Hello, I think, yeah, I've had my camera off a lot because the, inter the internet is weird. Um, and Kelly can jump in. I wanna say it's either 12 or 15 out of the students total in, is it 15, Kelly, or 12? I would be more comfortable just saying that there's about 5% of the remote students are on IEPs. Yeah. Instead of yeah. talking the, yeah. Right, and we don't have a sense yet. Um, part of the, the challenge with the remote school is, um, you know, because their students, you know, we're all teaching kids that we don't, you know, that we haven't watched come up through the ranks. So part of this is assessing where the students are at and who has struggles.
Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jael, next. And then before we get into round two, I have a note from Keith in the chat that Lisa Hanna, who is another remote speaker, a uh, remote teacher rather, is, um, is offering to weigh in if uh, board members do not object. Are, is there any objection? No. Okay, so Jael, you go first and then we'll hear from Lisa. So my question is just about um, the, uh, I believe Kay was mentioning computers and um, devices and I was under the impression that all students were being supplied with computers. Um, and so I'm just a little confused about that. And so if someone could clarify, cause, and I mean, is it our, is it the computers that we're providing that aren't working properly? Um, I can actually answer that all families were provided with the opportunity to pick up a school device. Not all families have chosen to access that opportunity. Um, and then the other issue we we have had a just we we had a you know the the tablet we had a little tablet challenge for the younger kids um, that Keith has been working and has been able to straighten out remotely. So. Um, so all students in the remote school have been offered school devices. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Lisa, Hannah. Hi, I, um, so first I would just like to thank the board and um, I just wanted to offer um, just my willingness to express uh, some thoughts about remote learning. I'm teaching fifth and sixth grade remote learning um, and my class size is at 24 right now. Um, so for one, I just want to echo um, all of what Kate said about both the celebrations and the challenges and struggles we're facing right now um, in this really uncharted territory. Um, there's so many celebrations and it's been um, refreshing in so many ways to see those student faces on my screen and to start to connect with them. Um, but it really, like Kate said, is a, is a puzzle beyond all puzzles to try to put together. Um, and I think something that I personally am experiencing, which is you know echoing what Kate said, but just the level of um, taking what we know as educators as best practice for kids at this developmental level, um, you know, which which means consistent feedback and, and letting them know that we're seen and you know we're halfway through week two, so we're really just building community right now. Um, but you know, compounding that with you know us being sort of sole tech support from afar, um, and you know the challenges of internet in central Vermont, but also. Also devices, you know, many of my kids have school provided devices, which is amazing. Um, but what we're realizing is whether it's internet capacity or devices, there's a lot of functions that, that I can't do in the classroom, like screen share while a video is playing um, without all students' devices sort of really struggling to see that. So, you know, I'm, I'm just learning, you know, we're all learning together and I'm learning some of the limitations, but in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's really helping me realize that you know, the, the tools are a little bit limited. Um, I'm troubleshooting tech issues and also working with kids who are really having to, um, having to grow their executive functioning skills probably in a way that's, that's, you know, way beyond their developmental level in their ability to manage a schedule and all these new tech tools. And so to try to support that and provide that amount of feedback for kids so that they feel supported, um, feels really challenging for me. Um, and I did just want to add that, there, um, that the, the remote learning team of elementary teachers did uh, express some collective concerns around instructional abilities um, to the administrative team. And so I just wanted to put that out there. There was a collective statement um, from our remote learning team. Um, and I think that's important. I think we're all super willing and excited um, to learn and to, to really put 110% out there. Um, and, and we just wanna do the best for our students and families. Um, and I think we're, we're just trying to navigate that all at the same time. Thank you, Lisa. I, I think all of us also are aware that um, you are all doing pioneering work here. And um, it's inherently 
really hard and um, we very much appreciate it and we'll do everything we can to support it. Um, so uh, I have Jill, Diane and Chris in the second round. Thanks, um, Scott. Um, so I guess I just had one follow-up question, which is I'm, I'm definitely hearing um, some uh, a fair amount of concern that 31 is too many. And I'm just curious if there is a sense for what would be the right number from people who feel like 31 is too many, especially as I'm also hearing Brian say he thinks there may be some you know, sugaring off and the, and think the numbers may change. So I, I didn't know if, if anyone had identified, you know, sort of what the target would be. If, if 31 definitely is too high, what's the right number? And I don't know if that's been identified by people who feel we need to take some action. Brian, do you have a, a response to that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I would go back to uh, it's only the second week of school um, and, and, I, and I appreciate Kate and Lisa uh, uh, being, you know, being here today to talk about the challenges because uh, it's definitely, I mean, I think there's definitely a learning curve. It's very difficult just to do something brand new. I think it would be difficult with the technical thing with 10 kids, not let alone 29 kids. Uh, the, the thing is, we don't know where that number is going to be uh, and, you know, that's that's part of the issue. Uh, you know, it's kind of you know, we got a few more weeks to go before we hear about if, if I mean, Julie said that it might be a sign sealed and delivered from the uh, uh, from the legislature. I haven't gotten any official word from anyone. Um, I don't know if Lori have, has heard anything. I, uh, I don't believe she has. So, a, can I just it's not it's not quite my question. My question was for those people who are advocating that 31 is too many. Is there a number that they think it should be? That's what I'm trying oh. to understand. So if not mm -hmm. 31, how many? And maybe no one has landed on a number. But um, Brian, I hear your position that you think we mm -hmm. need to wait. And and I agree, the legislature, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not advocating. I'm just mm -hmm. I'm just trying to gather the information. And I feel like I'm not clear on what target people who are saying 31 is too many would feel more comfortable with, or if that number has been identified. It's really just a question. Uh, if Lisa and Kate would like to give their uh, two cents as the two teachers who are being impacted the most by this. Well, actually I'll, I'll jump in as, as remote principal because um, I don't know if I, if I were a teacher asked to answer that question, I might feel a little awkward. I think the question is, what is the, the magic number is that um, we don't really know because this is a whole uh, brand new adventure. 31 is a lot. Um, and, and it is about waiting to see sort of how things sugar off. Um, I know there's, uh, you know, I know at least at Doty, there's at least one fifth, sixth grader who's sort of, who's currently in person, who's on the edge of switching to remote and sort of waffling. So I guess there's sort of, there may be other kids and families in that position. So it's, it's really hard because we've, um, we've, um, we've, we've honestly embarked on this adventure, not really fully knowing and, and having research to back us up because it is all so very new. I mean, I would be happy to spend some time um, coordinating with Brian and looking at research and figuring out what an ideal number might be. Um, but I, we haven't tossed around saying, well, 31 is too many, but 24 isn't. We haven't gotten that specific in our conversations. Okay. That's can I add something? That's helpful. Yeah. Gillian, can uh, I add something? Um, uh, yes, Kate, and then Lisa. Sorry, Scott. We, please. So I, I don't, I would agree. I'm not sure what the magic number is. What I do know is that I have 45% more students in my class than any other elementary other than Lisa Hanna in my class. So 45% more compared to like, you know, the next teacher below Lisa. So that's, it. My, that means my time is divided that much more for every student to get their needs met than in another classroom. So there's only one of me <laughs> and you're dividing me up a little bit more than a, 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 another teacher. So I don't know if there's a student 
number, but you're dividing me up in more ways, I guess, <laughs> into more pieces. <laughs> that, that's kind of vivid, Kate. Um, uh, Lisa? Thanks. Um, I would completely agree with Kate, and I think right. What we know is what that we don't know what that number is. Right, we're in uncharted territory, and the research is not there around remote class sizes. Um, you know, but one little nugget of guidance, right, is that the Vermont Educational Quality Standards does recommend um, for elementary classes to be below twenty five, and so, you know, that that number you know, is in a time that is not right now too. And so we can look at that number as the recommendation for, you know, a known in-person time. Um, and, and clearly, right, that number probably needs to be adjusted for a digital platform where both teachers and students and families are learning new tools um, and new learning management systems. And then also just what the digital platform, how that changes. Um, you know, our best practice in terms of the classroom. But, you know, that that's a number that I think we can at least use as a touchstone that if, if the educational quality standards are recommending below 25, that then we need to use that to, you know, do our best to help guide adjusting that for this new time. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it appears that Alicia is, before we um, go back to the board members, um, Alicia, you're, you're on this topic as well? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Um, in typical years, in the spring, grade level teams get together to pretty extensively do student placement, right? And we place students into classrooms and we kind of look at needs and try to create balanced classrooms. And that's something that wasn't able to happen um, in this sense this year. So I, I also think that um, it's not just a numbers conversation, but it's looking at kind of the the balance of needs in the classroom and the type of support students might need. You know, I know a question earlier was around how many students are on plans and, you know, I don't think it's just about students on plans. I think it's really about making sure classes are balanced. You know, in some of my my classrooms in East Montpelier, we have smaller class sizes, but the needs are far greater. And so really they balance out with a class that may be much larger in number um, just because of student needs. And I just wanted to make sure that was pointed out. Great, many, many thanks. This is a very rich discussion. And Diane, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm going to preempt you again because Stephen Luke has, uh, hasn't had a chance to talk yet. Um, Stephen, then Diane, then Chris. Um, yeah, so big talk. Um, I'd say historically, we've never gotten anywhere with a discussion on class size. That's where we, why we are where we are now. I've tried to be mindful of what I've heard people say, um, but I'll present what I'm gonna say is my own. Um, 29, 30, 31 students in a class is too big. Point blank, it's too big. I'm not comfortable with that as a board member. So from my perspective, I want to, would wanna hear uh, in two weeks either, the class size has been reduced down closer towards 25 or um, that there's a this is the plan that's going to reduce it down closer to 25 and for me tonight that's all i need to know 30 is too big i don't want it that big i don't care if it's remote or not remote for me for all i know about class sizes it exceeds what i'm comfortable with i don't expect a solution tonight i don't expect the boards going to be able to brainstorm a solution. Um, but I want the administration to know, from my perspective, I don't want to hear in two weeks that we've got a class size of 30 without a plan to reduce that, or at least two options or three options that the board can consider to reduce that. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Um, Diane, then Chris, then Floor. I was just simply going to say it context is everything. So when we look at 30, that's a third of the remote students are in one classroom. 
then when we also compare it to our in schools, you know, Dodie right now for the entire building has 56. And so, you know, when we're looking at the context of things, just noticing and balancing out exactly as Stephen's saying is really that's too large of a number. So what's the plan moving forward? Um, so basically, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think, uh, again, I'm going to go back to uh, what I've been saying all along that, I, you know, I appreciate everyone talking about um, providing their insight and their input uh, again, but I, and we're talking about maximum class sizes. And I think that uh, it's only right to consider, do we also have to consider minimum class sizes? Um, and because I think anytime you start having these conversations, we're talking about two, there are four, according to my count here, we have 48 classrooms in the district. Um, and out of the 48 classrooms, we're talking about, you know, we've been talking now for the last uh, 35 minutes or so about these two classes, right? But there are, according to my accounts, we have 36 out of 48 classes are less than, if you believe what Malcolm Gladwell says, like Jonas uh, pointed out, eight, the sweet spot is 18 to 24. I know Lisa said that uh, it's less than 25 kids per class is what the, uh, you know, that somewhere around, so the sweet spot, if you believe Malcolm Gladwell, 18 to 24, or less than 25 from the Vermont, uh, Vermont quality standards, uh, you know, I think we also have to consider the minimum class sizes, um, you know, because we have, again, 36 out of 48 are less than 18. And so anytime you talk about class sizes, it also has an impact on the budget. So, you know, moving people around or hiring people, I mean, I mean, this is a really big decision. Uh, and you know, to say I want a solution in two weeks, uh, you know, the guidance is based on, uh, I mean, I want a solution now, but uh, I feel like, you know, not knowing what's going to happen until two weeks and how this will play out, the numbers could change, the money could change, and then I can come back and tell you what I, what we've learned. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult, you know, it's just one of those difficult scenarios. So um, I also think we need to look at minimum class sizes. I mean, we have a, if you look at the, uh, class size policy that was adopted by the school board uh, back on uh, June 12th, 2019. It talks about uh, you know, work, working with school superintendents, working with school boards, working with build, building principals, developing class minimum, maximum, and average class size. Do we, I mean, I had not seen any of that, the minimum, the maximum, we don't have that. So, uh, you know, and I know that's a policy. I'm just trying to, you know, make sure we're, we're doing this the right way. Because I think if we had something like that in place, this conversation would be a lot easier to have. Thanks, Brian. Um, okay, we've got Chris, uh, oh, no, sorry, Diane, Chris, Flora, and then, no, Diane? Um, Diane, Chris? I think Diane already went, so I, unless there's someone else. Okay, my, my apologies, sorry. Just move it along. Um, so my question are for um, um, Kate and uh, Lisa. Um, and Lisa, I heard you say that the, um, at least I thought I heard you say that the remote teachers as a collective had um, gotten together a statement of some kind and was, um, I think, addressed to the administration or the um, leadership team. And can you just, if that's an accurate recall, can you tell us what the statement was about by the remote um, um, teachers as a cohort? Sure. I mean, I, I can just say that in our time during in-service, um, I was really grateful to have time to work with the um, with my cohort of remote teachers. Um, and because, again, this is, you know, we can't say it enough, but this is unprecedented and uncharted times, right? And we all know that everyone, including administration, is, is working so hard to figure this out to provide the best opportunities for our students and learners. And what we, you know, what we sort of realized as we came together as a cohort of teachers is that um, there was a need to articulate some of the things that as instructors with, you know, a lot of years of teaching um, under our belts, um, just the places that we were seeing um, either just holes or concerns or things that we wanted to make sure that were addressed, um, you know, by us, but also through a collective voice from administration so that we could feel like we we're helping to create a program that is robust as possible. And so um, we just did submit a collective, you know, just an email that expressed 
what we saw as where the program was and what we saw as places that the program is needed to um, have some more consideration um, because we know that we're building this, we're all building this together as we go and we don't expect everything to be figured out um, and, and just wanted to have, to provide our input and offer our willingness to work together um, to help solve these problems or challenges. I don't wanna call them problems, right? But challenges that um, we noticed that we were facing. Um, so it was within that communication that there, you know, our remote team collectively just reached out to administration that said, hey, here, you know, as we're working, here's what we need help with, here's what we're seeing, here are our concerns, um, and we'd like to be a part of the team to help solve these concerns. Um, thank you very much. Um, my, my next question for you and for Kate is, um, you both uh, touched on um, having to uh, troubleshoot tech issues. Um, are they the type of issues that um, a, another person could come in and help with? Or would that, could that be done efficiently by someone else or, or not? Um, I can jump in for a second. I, I think uh, it's probably all of the above. <laughs> um, you know, I think there are some tech issues that, you know, if we had, and, and our IT department has been amazing and Keith has been amazing. Um, from my perspective, you know, I poor them. I've been reaching out to them um, so many times during the day to try to help troubleshoot. Sorry, my three-year-old is talking to me. <laughs> um, but I also, also some of it is just the challenge of right remote learning when you know my learners and their internet connection are in another town or in somewhere else. So I'm I'm trying to help them, guide them through the troubleshooting in their own house from afar, while also trying to keep you know instruction going. So it, it's a mix of you know, having, certainly having some um, centralized, I don't know, dedicated support would help. We've been getting as much as we possibly can and folks have been working so hard. Um, and then there also is just the piece of individual devices or individual internet connections at certain times of the day and just how you balance that, um, you know, within your, your working to create an instructional day for a large group of students. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can I add to that? Sure. So uh, Lisa's right, right? Like tech is doing everything they can to support us, but it's really hard if you're not in the Zoom classroom with your group, large group of students, right? To see what the actual problem is. And if you want your student to learn at that moment, Right, you need to troubleshoot it at that point in time to see if you can fix it for them so that they can access the learning at that moment. Right, there's a lot that can be done after the school day is over by sending, you know, help request or calling the parents and trying to do that. But some of it's just, you know, your, you know, your connection isn't working right now. Log back off, log back on. Your audio is not working. Right, so it's a lot of you know, on the fly sort of things you have to do to support them with technology mm -hmm. um, because of, you know, various issues with bandwidth and with the devices they're using or how many devices are being used in the home, right? So um, it's not something that like IT can solve um, instantly, right? They're slammed, right. right? So we have to do what we can to solve it with the family. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Um, well, can I actually just piggyback on because one of the challenges with remote teaching is when you're teaching in person, you can walk around and see if the student is clicking on the wrong icon. And when you're teaching remotely, you can't just sort of walk through the room behind the, um, behind the kids as they're working. So I think that that's also part of one of the challenges that I know in our meetings, teachers have talked about like, oh, if I were just in person, I could say, oh, click here and point to it. And we can't do that remotely. Thank you. Um, Flor, very patient, thanks. Yeah, so I, I just that, uh, not, not even a point of order, because I I love this conversation. This is the kind of conversations that I love. I just don't think that we would be able to resolve it tonight ourselves there, and our agenda is so long. I, I wanted to just add one thing about what Stephen said. So I think, Brian, I feel like you're feeling constrained by what our future budget is going to be like. 
And I guess I would want to be a little more optimistic that either the federal government is going to take a much more FDR approach to the future of this country and really invest in, in education as we know the needs. So the students do not have a year to lose. So I think what we're trying to say is like collaborate with your team and your teachers and which you know how to do and then add student, you know, student needs. I, I'm not even concerned about you know the number, just what the student needs are. And don't feel constrained. It's just present us an option that works now because those students can't wait for for the data. So and let's, you know, just because our agenda is so long, I know that you got you guys on the ground have more expertise and I have faith in your whole team to resolve this. Thank you, Flora. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, we have finite reserves of, of energy and powers of concentration. Um, uh, how about, Lindy has, has raised her hand in the meantime. Um, how about we move on after Lindy, if there is no objection? Go for it, Lindy. Mine's really quick because of all these concerns that people are bringing up. And when Gillian just mentioned about uh, moving around your room, one of the things I'm finding as a remote teacher that you can't do is say the three of you go work over in the corner because you can't do breakout rooms without an adult in that breakout room with the children. So on Zoom, we can go to a breakout room as adults and do our other business. But when you're the only teacher, you've got it in Kate's case, you know, 30, 31 kids and their little postage stamp faces there. They can't go off and work on a little project while you're working with 25 other ones. So I, I, there's just a lot of difference in the remote class and there's a lot of difference in our class, class sizes compared to that. Many thanks. Okay. Um, I'm sure staffing would be a whole lot easier. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could say that. Uh, so uh, right now we have a, a number of vacancies. Um, so uh, that we're uh, that are something we've been working to try to fill. Uh, there's believe, there's not a lot of people that are applying for these positions currently, uh, and I'll go through some of them right now. Uh, we do have a we were able to um, uh, transfer someone over to uh, Doty, uh, but we, uh, uh, and right now that, that uh, created a, a vacancy over at U32. Uh, it's a temporary transfer currently, um, and we've been filling that in with uh, substitute custodians, but it's, it's, still, uh, it's still a hole that uh, we, or we still have to uh, wait out. We are looking to hire a custodian at Rumney. Uh, we, uh, may be, we may have to be hiring a, a math middle school position middle school math position. Uh, you know, that is a, a personnel matter that I cannot comment on right now. Um, we have a number of uh, BI uh, positions. Uh, so uh, we've had, a, this has been a, one of those areas where I know uh, Kelly in, in particular has worked extremely hard in trying to build our own internal capacity. And I know we've spoken about this at previous board meetings. Uh, we've tried to hire our own BIs. Uh, unfortunately, there are no BIs that have been applying uh, for positions, and uh, we've had these positions posted for uh, several weeks. Uh, we do uh, intend uh, we're to fill these positions for some of our most need, uh, for some of our children who really need them uh, dearly, uh, and we're going to have to go back to a contract service provider. Um, so uh, we intend to fund these three BI positions uh, using funds from the two BIs who went out and were approved on leave. We did have two BIs that uh, were uh, approved for a year of unpaid leave. Um, and so uh, we also have some uh, savings from special ed tuition. So we should be able to fund those three positions. Uh, on, uh, there is also, Kelly has also informed me that uh, some families, we anticipate to have some families moving into the district that also may require hiring two additional BIs. So we're looking at anywhere between three to five BIs. Uh, Kelly, is there anything else that we need to mention here on that one? No, you covered it. Oh, uh, well, th well thank and thank you for your leadership in this area, Kelly. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, something that I know we want to report to the board that we're, we have it all filled up and with our own. And we're not contracting uh, service providers, but uh, we're back to that, that we're back to this area again. 
Um, we also are uh, trying to fill a 0.76 para at Doty. Um, we're uh, waiting uh, for more uh, more information on that. Uh, we're trying to uh, we're in the process of trying to fill that position. Uh, we did have we are we have a food service worker position at U32, uh, but that's been on hold. Uh, the um, administration at U32 uh, it says let's put that on hold right now and see uh, how the food how the food service is uh, playing out. Uh, Rumney will need a, a pre-K uh, position that's being filled currently, but uh, uh, we need to make sure that uh, you know we we have the right uh, folks in that position. We're also looking for a para educator. Uh, we did hire a para educator at U32. Uh, we are also uh, trying to hire a food service 0.38 food service at Doty. Uh, it's it's always a challenge to try to find you know. 0.38 positions and 0.36 and not full-time uh, positions. So that's a, uh, it's a, a challenge. And then last but not least, uh, and you'll see in the board packet at the end, we also have a uh, need to uh, technology director. Um, you know, Keith will be uh, leaving us uh, and we thank him for his service. He's done great work. We'll talk more about him at the, uh, at the other uh, end of the uh, meeting tonight. Any questions about the staffing? Um, I, I would um, suggest maybe we talk about early retirements and that, since that's in the same personnel yep. realm and then entertain questions. Yeah. Give me one second. I had the piece of paper here. <laughs> one second. Here it is. So early retirements, uh, the early retirement option was sent to 55 people 23 uh, people, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Uh, final retirement information was sent to 55 people. The deadline was yesterday. Uh, 15 people are taking it. Uh, seven prof uh, professional from the professional and related and eight from the ESP. And the uh, total numbers by school, the breakdown is three at Berlin, four at East Montpelier, seven at U32, and one from central office. Thank you very much. Um, any any questions from board members on on the staffing and early retirement piece? Jonas. Uh, Lori, I wonder if you have you know any early projections about what those early retirement numbers are going to mean. I mean, I know it's a sort of a long term uh, process of how that plays out financially. I wonder if you have any sense at this point. Right. Um, we had looked at it as a multi-year item because it's a three-year payout. And so what I'm in the process of doing is calculating that cost. The information just was finalized last night. And also during the budget process, we'll be working with the principals to try to determine what if any of those positions would not be filled. Got it, thank you. I think we're all looking forward to seeing how this is gonna play out. True, yes. Um, other questions on staffing or early retirement? If not, let's um, do enter plan update. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is a quick one, uh, just so you know. So uh, the uh, I've, uh, we've uh, basically finished all but one central office administrator I, I've been able to meet with uh, regarding the entry plan. I still have one uh, co-principal to meet with uh, from the principal uh, group. I've met with uh, six board of education members. So I'm gonna be start, starting to, uh, you'll be getting some phone calls if you haven't uh, gotten some uh, already. Uh, so uh, we can spend some quality time together uh, individually uh, talking about uh, the district, looking forward to it. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, just wanna give you an update. That's where we're at right now. Great, many thanks, Brian. Um, congratulations on sticking with a plan at a time when most plans just kind of go poof. Um, <laughs> uh, so now we move on to finance committee discussion and action. Um, financial report. Uh, Floor, do you want to take the lead on this? Sure. Uh, I, I first wanted to start by thanking Lori. It's, it's been a lot of work. We had a really condensed uh, session for our financials, which is 
thanking uh, Lori and Brian for coordinating, but also extending that to Virginia, Penny, Matt, and hopefully I'm not forgetting Melissa, and I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but hopefully I'm not, but the entire, entire team. So uh, I was gonna say that we spoke a lot of different things, so I'm gonna do a quick summary, but then let the expert who knows way better than me and, and ran us through the whole, the whole thing so that we don't, uh, unless people had questions, uh, we don't we don't spend a ton of time in in the first part. So Lori update us in the COVID CARES relief fund. And we submitted, we applied for 366,342 uh, for last year. And we have so far just received $41,000 uh, for, for the grant for the food program. It, the rest is still in the hands of the legislature. And this year we'll be applying uh, for $744,000, right, Lori? And another 492 for Efficiency Vermont. So as, as far as the relief plan, I think we're doing really well. And if people have specific uh, questions, I would open it up to ask those specific questions to, to Lori in that, in that part. And uh, just wanna say that all of that is by December uh, 30, most of the relief care uh, money has to be filed for so that we can receive that money for us. So Lori, I'll open it up for you first. And then if board members have questions on that first part. Just to say that we did um, just barely received uh, the sub grant award for the Efficiency Vermont 492,000. Yeah. So we're excited. <laughs> we are excited, um, which is a, a, an emotion that we cherish in these times. Um, so Fleur, back to you. Yeah. And, and then I just board members, do you guys have questions on that first, on that first about the COVID relief? And then I'm gonna let uh, Lori run us by the financial update, just the highlights, Lori, the last two, the last page pretty much. Go just ahead. to thank you for it being so clearly outlined that I appreciate that, it's very helpful. I see uh, Chris or, or Jonas, were you up there first? And Chris? Um, Jonas, you can go ahead if you like. Oh, I just never removed myself earlier. I know, okay. Um, so Laurie, can you um, tell the board what um, commitments we've actually um, received um, in terms of reimbursements for the COVID spending that we've, uh, we've done and also what the process is for um, the uh, response on other uh, filings that we've made, and, and just kind of explain that the what you what you described before as the spider net effect um, of the various submissions. Sure. So for last year, we originally started um, waiting for four hundred and eighteen thousand. At the time of printing the report for last year, um, I had that number down to three hundred sixty-six thousand. So we did receive the difference. Um, since the time of printing the report, we've received another 41,000. So we actually have last year um, for the receivable down to 326,000 right now. Um, we've been told that the legislature did fully fund that in the appropriation. Um, we just haven't received a grant award for that amount yet. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, the spider webs on page seven at the top. And what I was trying to show you there were the different funding sources we've been applying for. Uh, the first one is called the Summer Food Program. And we did receive um, a total of 50, almost 51,000 um, in our award for that. Um, I've been told the applications are opening soon for us to apply for additional money uh, for our fall food program. So I have a meeting tomorrow uh, with the Child Nutrition Program to go through how that would work out. Um, the next item was Efficiency Vermont. Um, the board had heard about all the isolation rooms, the HVAC systems, and then the Callus project that um, we're working on. Um, we did get our grant award just this week for 492,000. So that's exciting. Um, and the spider web is, as I described it, was that we have learned that FEMA funds um, may be available for school districts. So by September 2nd, every school district was asked to file an application to FEMA. 
And the types of things that we were told would be considered are things like the health monitoring equipment we purchased to take temperatures at the point of entry at the buildings. Um, the additional nurses that we've had to um, hire, our COVID coordinator. Um, the challenge with the spider web is that FEMA tends to pay 75%. And so then we would have to submit the additional information to the agency of ed to get the other 25%. Um, the other item I forgot to mention for FEMA is the PP&E, the protective um, equipment. So, and there's some software as well. So long story short, it's, it's kind of like doing your tax return actually. Um, you know, you have to get to one schedule to get to the next. Um, the reason I was complimenting my staff is they've been working really hard at photocopying uh, close to a thousand pages of documentation. Um, and in addition to that, um, we've had to um, reformat everything from the typical standard applications where you would have a function and an object to the various funding sources. They've each asked for it under a different type of justification and category system. Um, the agency of ed CRF fund is the one that's still open that we just talked about that the legislatures um, hopefully and I believe they are appropriating more money for the fiscal year 21. The fiscal year 20 needs were supposedly met. Um, I filled out an application with multiple columns uh, for different months and for different years. And then the last fund um, is the ESSER grant which is um, a fixed rate, it's around 250,000. And that um, would be what I call the wraparound. So where those other funds all expire for services after December 30, the ESSER fund continues on for a few more months into this fiscal year. So for example, um, if that health monitoring equipment, for example, or something else was going to end by December 31st, I would then put them into the ESSER grant for the balance that I didn't get reimbursed from those other funding sources. So you can see I'm excited because it is a challenge and um, multiple facets to this. Uh, did I miss anything from the finance committee that you guys wanted me to add to? Okay. Thank you. So, Lori, can you move on into the actual financial uh, report, the, the fund balance, and just do that quick run that you did with us? Okay, sure. Um, page you. eight, um, the beginning fund balance for operations reserved is 2.5 million. And you can see that we've increased that for the revenue and expenses for several items. Um, that's for this CARES um, relief fund, as well as the Efficiency Vermont money that would funnel through the budget. Um, when we get all said and done, if you look toward the bottom, you will see that if we maintained a 2% fund balance, um, we would reserve 708,000, which would leave 1.8 million if we do collect um, all the funds that we've applied for. Um, at this time, we've asked the board not to do any action to transfer to capital or other things until we can get through the next few weeks to determine if there's still some pot of money that we need uh, for some of those costs that might go from, say, next April to June. Um, below that line are two items that are currently reserved. One is for tech equipment. We have a multi-year tech plan. Um, currently, the balance in that fund is 358000 and we still had a software budget um, reserved in case we had to purchase our own software. At this time, the state software would not cost any money. However, we would need to consider additional staffing to help with the software conversion. So there's 309,000 there. Um, those funds total 667,000 and that's on top of the other fund balance. It's in addition to. And I'm gonna keep moving um, on the next page, page nine. Um, what's different, and I put it in the memo um, that we wrote, is that there's a lot of funds that you have never had on your financial report before um, because some of them were school specific. So um, the first part are the grants, which are at the top left. We do have about 1.9 million in other grants that come through our district. Um, you usually receive it and spend it or you don't collect it. So it's a net impact of zero. And then over to the right, there are these restricted funds. Some of them were at the elementary schools and the high school. Um, 
people have either passed away and left us money or done um, uh, sponsorship of things um, while they're alive. And those are called permanent funds or trust funds or agency funds. Um, so those are over to the right. And the agency funds, if I had to put it in a different uh, description, and I will for the next report, it would pretty much say student activity funds. It's things like um, people do fundraising for fifth, sixth grade um, graduation type of things. Um, they also do things um, at, like at the high school, they might do a fundraiser over the years and they might go overseas for like a hockey trip. So that's what student activity funds are. And I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> um, and then in the middle is the typical capital fund. And you will see if you look down at where um, it says current um, capital project balance available, you will see that by the time we conclude these projects, um, only three entities will have money remaining in their capital funds. The others will have spent it entirely. Um, the funds that would remain would be 906,000 at East Montpelier. Um, the central office, um, provided I can get our renovations from the, the CARES fund, would have a balance of 117,000. And then what we call the WCU USD fund, which is currently the district wide fund that in the future would be used for all schools, um, would have a balance of 163,000. And then just in summary at the bottom, um, there's another set of books um, that we track. It's called Fund 6, they're enterprise funds. Um, you can see that we've pretty much talked about food service a lot. Um, they ended the, the sum of all the programs added up throughout the district with a fund balance of 214,000. Um, we do provide support of 149,000 in the budget process. Um, community Connections is another sub-entity within our set of books. Um, we did budget 40,000 this year, and you can see that it's projected to break even at this time. Um, and those two funds are really um, also changing um, significantly with all the COVID um, requirements for the meals served this year, um, as well as the daycare. So we need to update those projections. These were what we were projecting at the time of budget. Over to the right, we have two self-funded programs. One is the dental and the other is the HRA and you will see they're um, doing well and they have ending balances there. Um, and I mentioned to the finance committee that um, in the next month or two, we need to look at all the fund balances and try to figure out what funds could better um, be reserved for other purposes. The board does have permission to transfer funds so for example, if the dental fund only needed 100,000, the board has permission uh, from the voters to take the additional money and transfer it uh, back to the capital fund or to the general fund, et cetera. So the good news is um, the board does have voter permission to make changes um, down the road. So it's all good news. Hard to believe. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, any any board member questions at this point? Hey, look, uh, Scott, I just want to add that the, a couple of questions for the board to be aware of that came up from from this is that obviously as a district we have to be better and we're going to transfer something from the fund balance uh, for our capital plan. We're really low for the amount of buildings that we have, and the second is that we are looking into a bill 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 for who we hire for being our um, you know, a building and expert uh, person to help us with with all of this. Right now, we've been paying him from the capital fund, and that should be a position that is in our admin as any other member of the the staff that helps us get yeah. get everything done and get him out yeah. of because it's not going to be just of the work. He is just doing work for the district. So those came up. So I wanted you to be aware and. We can move on because we have the, the health stuff. Thank right. you. That's thank you very much, Flora. Um, I appreciate your pointing those out. Um, shall we move on then to the health reimbursement and flexible spending accounts? Um, we have action. <laughs> I, I beg your pardon. 
No, so sure, yeah. you're going to make a motion um, first and then have us discuss it, or yeah, do you want to discuss a, both yeah, and then have the motion motions first. after? Um, I'd like to have the motion um, on the table first. Uh, if anybody, if whoever looks at page 10 or 11, I believe, um, the motion is the language of the motion is at the top. Would anyone care to make it? I'll move that we um, approve the health reimbursement and flexible spending accounts budget for FY21-22. Thank you. Jonas, do you second? Great. Okay. Chris moves. Jonas seconds. Um, all right. Lori. <laughs> Um, so in summary, we self fund um, the first $5,000 of the health insurance plan um, and the first $2,500 of the uh, for a single plan and 5,000 is for a two person or, or family. Um, this fund is set up to be separate from the budget. Um, we do um, also cover for employees who contribute money voluntarily for their um, dependent care or flexible spending account. And so anyway, um, this fund is doing really well. Um, we are also gonna relook at this as part of the budget. But for right now, the reason why it's important to approve both of these budgets tonight is because we send out open enrollment packets to employees and they're um, able to use this information to um, make a decision on what they wanna do for health insurance effective January 1. So we send out the packets um, in October and well, excuse me, within a couple of weeks. And then we would receive it back in time to get this included in the first draft of the budget. Um, do you have any other questions about this? Anybody? Uh, it sounds as though you've wowed them, Lori, once again. <laughs> um, so if you're ready for a vote on this motion, all in favor of approving the health reimbursement and flexible spending accounts budget for FY21-22 as proposed on page 11. Please click yes. If opposed, click no. And I'm seeing all yeses. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, for the next bit, uh, it's a similar setup. Um, the language of the motion is at the top. Would anyone care to make that motion? I can do it. Floor? I can do it. So uh, to set the, uh, for year 21 dental insurance rates as follow. Is that right, Lori? Single plan 500 and, oh, sorry, single plan 552 second person plan 1,080 and family plan 1,512. Great, thank you, Flora. Is there a second? Jonas seconds, thanks. Sorry, Lindy. His reflexes are better, at least on this occasion. Um, okay, uh, Lori, do you wanna take this one? Um, so, We've had this self-funded plan for 26 years. Um, we've only had nine insurance um, increases during that time. So it's pretty good plan. Um, the thing that we noted was that the reason why in actual 2020, we had such a large surplus was because when the governor shut down the ability to go to dentists, um, we ended up having a surplus. Um, some of it is related to dentists couldn't bill in a timely manner. And the other part is employees could not access um, the, in, the care. So having said that, um, one of the recommendations is down the road, um, we would be analyzing this may, around December, January at the latest to determine um, if the employees would be due a refund because they were not able to access the insurance out of that surplus. Um, the district would also receive its share of the surplus. So we talked about some options. And at this point, I think we aren't asking for permission for that tonight. Um, we just needed a few more months for the claims to trickle in to confirm that we wouldn't have a loss this year as a result of that surplus. Great, thank you. A any board member questions? If not, then all in favor, please click your yes button 
Opposed? Click no, please. Um, once again, I see all, <laughs> I see all the yeses from board members and some from non-board members, but I'm glad that it meets with popular approval too. Great. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, what are we on next? Sorry. Budget process. Budget process. Thank you, Flora. Um, are we, is this an action item, Lori, or um, do you need action or do, is a board consensus enough for you? One would work. Um, we were just hoping to get direction so that we could start the budget process. Great, okay. Um, would you like to uh, present it and then see what people have to say? Um, sure, I wasn't sure if Brian was gonna go first. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, basically we uh, looked at the uh, budget timeline uh, that was uh, developed by, uh, last year, and we tried to make some tweaks to it because we're uh, in, you know, we had COVID. We were basically planning a lot of time in the beginning of the summer and throughout the summer on uh, the COVID piece. So uh, we have a timeline that we're trying to get approved tonight. Uh, there are some uh, areas in here where some dates may not be exactly correct. I believe, Lori, we talked about the uh, your birthday being one of them that we're we're hoping to not have uh, your birthday in March as as the uh, annual meeting date. But uh, that's what we're look. We're, there's certain things we may have to look into, uh, like a certain date, not because of Lori's birthday. I'm, I'm all, all kidding aside, just because we want to make sure that is the exact date for statute. All right, Lori, just making sure. Sorry, sorry about your birthday, but. <laughs> No, she's she's proposing a 60th birthday party. So. <laughs> yes, that that was true. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. Um, all right. So I uh, the thing that Brian had mentioned um was that it, it you I'm just gonna say what you said at finance, Brian, was that we had our budget pass with a two to one margin, um, and kind of the methodology that we've been using has been working well. Um, it starts with a level service budget where we roll up staffing and I've already been meeting with each principal in the last two days to roll up who's currently in here and their benefits. Um, we also look at a special ed service plan that is due to the state by mid-October and then obviously there are changes to that by the time we finalize the budget. Um, we have a lot of um, contracts that are in motion for next year like our bus contract um, and technology, we have a multi-year plan. Uh, we have debt schedules that are fixed for some of our loans. Um, so that's usually how we start the budget process. Um, we usually do a lot of the work behind the scenes. Um, and then the board um, usually gets brought in as we get closer to a, a rolled up draft. Um, what was unique about last year was it was our first year of doing a combined budget. So the leadership team met separately and then also together so that we put in a lot of time um, mapping out staffing and looking at equity and comparable resources throughout the system. Um, having said that, there was a long list of items that were new initiatives. Um, the leadership team prioritized those. Um, we tried to quantify and cost out those items um, coming up with some were a single year, some were multi-year. Um, and that's how we did the process last year. It worked. I think well. Um, we also presented the first draft to the board in November and um, the next draft came through in December. Uh, by January we need to finalize the budget, um, but just remember that until the legislature determines some of the tax information, um, that really does impact the tax rate and the final budget. So that usually doesn't happen until after December 15th. Um, Again, January 15th is typically the last day to finalize budgets. Um, we did try to map out a calendar that would follow this protocol with the number of community forms that we offered through the last budget process. Um, when we met at the finance committee, if it's okay with you guys, I'll just read off. Um, there were some items that we added to the section that says FY 21-22. Um, things that we had were consider equity for staffing based on student needs develop resources needed to compare information by building, um, include the um, continuous improvement plan work that took place this spring over in Doty, 
um, consider equity and in information regarding ESTs and MTSS. Uh, consider the implementation plan, um, school board goals from the retreat, um, the K learning from the entry planning um, that Brian put together, as well as um, the curriculum audit review. Um, it sounded like that might be a multi-year initiative. It might not all be, you know, things that can be put together in time for the budget, uh, but it might be a multi-year plan. Um, we also need to consider the external impacts, um, what's going on. Um, with Congress um, and the state of Vermont Ed Fund, obviously. Um, sounds like we wanted to have meetings where the public um, could come and follow up uh, with us, kind of like they did for the pandemic meeting, um, sooner rather than later, and um, have a question um, that they would answer of what do you um, want us to know about next, you know, that we should consider in next year's budget planning. Um, I think that was all the notes I had from finance uh, floor. Did I catch it all? Yeah, you, you, you got it all, uh, Lori, um, yeah. And, and so the joke about my birthday, I might as well just call a spade a spade, was that um, in the timeline, it said March 1st would be an annual meeting at U32. And it was an annual meeting this past year based on the bylaws. Um, I think we would have more of an informational meeting than an annual meeting, but I, we need to relook at the bylaws as they are now for the single district with all the edits and updates to confirm what is the date and what is the date range for those meetings. Um, because that one was set up as the annual meeting based on the old bylaws and all the town clerks had to be present and it was a different event than I think it would be this coming year. It just happens to be my birthday. Um, that was it. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Flor, Chris, Kari, um, it, it sounded to me as though Lori captured the, um, you know, the discussion pretty well, but is there anything that you would particularly want to highlight or, um, yeah. Flor? I, I think before we just uh, vote on this timeline to, to, make, to make sure that the entire board uh, understands it in the same page that uh, right around this time last year, we had a conversation about uh, you know, what the focus of the budget was gonna be. So those items that Laurie read at the end, you know, it's, it's important for us to you know, give at least that minimum guidance to them as they start to think about a level service uh, budget as a whole, not just as the finance committee, right? Thanks, Flor. Um, Chris? Um, I think last year we got um, um, jammed up a little bit uh, in the early December range where uh, the uh, budget proposal in terms of um, uh, dealing with issues that would be across the district to uh, improve student um, achievement across the district as a whole. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to um, consider things. So I think that's where, where I was going before with the finance committee where I think we I would like to build in more time sooner so that we we're not pressed for time in terms of making a decision. Um, because the way that the drafts look like, we wouldn't get the first draft of the budget until November 18th. Um, and then, you know, you have a second draft in early December. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem like there's a lot of time uh, for um, the board to consider uh, budgets or proposals um, and, and offer our input in between the two. So I would, I would urge that we maybe move things back by a week or two, just so we have more time for reflection. Thanks, Chris. Kari? Anything? No? <laughs> okay. I, I know you'll have much more later on down the line as the process unfolds. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, now, <clears throat> these are these are at least billed as as drafts. Um, do you want to vote on them as drafts, or do you want? Should we just um, uh, approve them by consensus? Uh, if there, if no board member objects, uh, Lori, what would serve your needs? And Brian, I'm sorry, I, I keep on thinking. Brian. What, what do you need? Uh, I, I would do, I, I... Oh, sorry. 
I would defer to Lori on this. You were on the right track. I would definitely go with the uh, the expert who's been here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think the budget timeline can be evolve. Um, really, what we're trying to figure out is is what would that first draft entail, and is level service still the theme that the board would like to continue with as you have for I'm not even sure maybe ten years. Is that still the way you'd like us to start the budget process? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, does anybody want to weigh in on that question? Or should we just go for a vote on um, approving the, the budget process as Lori has laid it out? Stephen, look, and then Chris. I guess I, what I would want to do is echo some of what Chris said uh, just a few minutes ago. If, if we're going to start with a level fund budget, then I, I agree with Chris, we need to get it <clears throat> a week or two earlier than what the current timeline suggests. Um, and I'm trying to, as I say this, I'm sorry, Lori, I'm trying to I'm trying to balance the board's need to make decisions in a compressed time frame with not um, working you completely to a ragged edge. But um, I'm wondering if there could be a level funded in something like a, I don't know, 2% lower budget, both presented um, at the earlier timeline. Lori? Sorry. Um, so I can do whatever the board would like. I just would like to have it be a unified decision that everyone um, agrees to so that we're not doing one year. I did 56 budget drafts and it was a lot. So I would appreciate it if the board would come to some consensus of whatever the decision is so that I would have clear direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, Fleur. So I, I, I guess I, I agree with, with Stephen. Let's have the love, level service uh, budget, but I would like to see at the same time uh, what, would a, what would a budget look like doesn't, uh, that focuses on EST and a multi tier system of supports. I don't, I don't want to lose that work that we've been doing. So um, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, we're looking for two, uh, for a, a level of service budget and a kind of um, what our druthers would be budget. Is that? Yeah, I, I guess last year we we the, the leadership team and and us kind of focused on that work, and I don't think one year is enough to to see results on that on that work. So I, I wouldn't want to. I know that there can be a lot of uh, um, interesting new initiatives. So I I, I really feel like, uh, and this is just my personal feel that I want to focus on on that on the multi tier system of supports. And whatever data we got from the continuous improvement plan meetings, because all of the schools, all of the principals were meeting. So whatever Jen has for that to collaborate with with Brian would be, I think would be helpful. What what is that number? Um, may I ask, is it feasible, Brian and Lori, to come up with a level of service budget and um, an alternative of the sort that Flora is describing? Uh, I would answer that. It, it, I think it could be possible. I mean, I think I, I still would need to uh, understand the uh, MT, you know, what the MTSS plan was from last year that uh, you mentioned with regards to the CIP planning. I also am interested in finding out, you know, finishing the entry plan and also trying to find out um, you know, if we do it, do some sort of audit review, I'm trying to, you know, get the information from, you know, what was done in the past, what's being planned in the past, uh, last year, what are some, um, uh, opportunities that, uh, folks are, are identifying from entry planning and also, uh, having some sort of audit that would, uh, uh, also inform 
the process. But I think that would be um, probably more likely for uh, you know not just next year, but going forward for a few forecasting it for a few years out. Because I don't think you know you can do all that work in one year. Yeah. Um, thanks, Diane. So I, I think kind of what I'm hearing Floor say, and I would assume this would come from the different principles too, is basically um, budgeting for what the needs are identifying. So looking at what the schools have really identified are the needs of the students and the maintaining that trajectory of the work that had been identified mm -hmm. is what I'm, I think I'm hearing Floor say. And then what I'm also hearing from you, Brian, and you had mentioned at the retreat was basically taking a look at the way the systems are working all around. And do we have the, the um, do we have the instruction the way we want it? Do we have the curriculum the way we want it? And do we have the supports from central office all the way to the schools as to where we want it? And I think in order to plan the best, we have to know what all of those options are um in a realistic way so that when we know what the actual revenue is then we can make the um balanced decisions of what makes the most sense for our schools and for our kids as opposed to um grabbing the the biggest pocket to where we can so i think that's what i'm hearing that's a very nice framing diane um I could uh, not have said it any better than what Diane just said. I think, I mean, I think she really hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it happens occasionally, but not. <laughs> this it happens occasionally. <laughs> I can only dream. Um, okay. Um, so how should we do this then? Um, do we want to uh, send Lori back with this draft? to um, say, okay, consensus on moving forward, given the discussion that you're hearing tonight. And um, let's see another version next time. Would that work? Because I think in general, um, sorry, Brian, go ahead. I was gonna ask Lori, let's ask Lori what she thinks she needs in terms of to be able to come back with something more specific so that we she so that we're not going working across purposes here. I mean what, what does she really need from us um, to be specific about for next time? Some years the board has said you can only increase the budget two percent. Um, some years the board has said you can only increase it um, three percent for example so and then some years it's been on an equalized pupil so I think what I'm trying to figure out is, is does the board want to see the first draft as the level service rolled up? And if that answer is yes, as a group, because uh, I've heard only part of this group speak, um, then it sounds like the costs associated with ESTMTSS need to be incorporated. Um, I don't have the answers on that. I would have to confer with the leadership team. Uh, the CIP, I would need to confer with the leadership team. Um, and Brian's entry plan for the system audit. So it sounded like it would be a level service budget with those as like, you know, kind of subtotaled with those as additional items to consider. Yeah. Is that what the, the board is saying that everyone on the board would like? Because I've got my answer if that's true. Well, um, let's, let's, I'd like to hear from Kari um, before we answer your question. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say something uh, similar to that, which is that um, I think at this stage, we know that we want um, a, a level service budget, but there's a little more work to do in terms of the board identifying other priorities. That includes what I've heard is Brian's reentry plan um, compilation, and also our board goals is another piece of that, which we're going to discuss more tonight. So I hate to kick it down the um, road. Um, but I think we need a little bit more time and another discussion to identify priorities that could build on that level service version. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, Stephen Luke, did you wanna say something? You're muted, Stephen. 
the only thing I was going to suggest was a pos possible path forward um, that what we could request uh, in the in a time frame earlier than what is proposed here in the agenda, say by a couple weeks, would be a level funded budget with just that. And then that gives the board uh, the rest of this meeting and some other meetings to provide more guidance on what we're looking for other than a level funded budget. But Lori, I, I, I think to ask you for a level funded budget is it, uh, as simple a guidance as you need. That's very clear. So maybe be able to provide that to us um, uh, two weeks prior to the 18th. And then on the 18th, um, be able to incorporate some of what the board will be, uh, what Kari is talking about, the board will be deliberating okay. on and prioritizing more towards the middle uh, of November, more towards Thanksgiving. So you're saying November 4th. So I'd add that to it to bring the level service to the November 4th meeting. And Stephen, when um, when you say level fund, you mean level service, is that correct? I mean level service. Okay, okay, Thank you. good. <clears throat> Jonas. Okay, so, um, does that, that, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, we'll start with the level of service while we talk about the priorities that will go into the, um, uh, that is, Lori will start with, the, with preparing the level of service while we, the board, discuss the priorities that will go into uh, a more elaborated version. Is that, Am I hearing correctly? I'm seeing nods. I'm hoping nobody <laughs> on another screen is shaking their head vehemently. Um, Jonas, please. Uh, but just to, in terms of timing, would we be looking forward to this on the 4th or the 18th? There have been a couple of you know strong opinions about getting this a couple of weeks earlier. Um, I'd, I'd lean in that direction, but I, want, I think we need to give Lori a straight answer there. Right, yeah. Um, Lori, I... Uh, can you do it by the fourth level yes. service? Yeah. Great. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Let's do that then. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Is that is that all you need then? Okay. Yes. Um, and then the timeline will just keep it moving. So. Okay. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, Jonas. Uh, do you have something more? No, okay. Um, so uh, we still have a ways to go. Do you want to take five and just kind of power nap or whatever you do to um, recharge your batteries, get a drink? <laughs> anyway, back at 816. See you all. Thanks. Um, 816, if we haven't lost our, um, our personnel. We're now on board operations, discussion, action, board retreat, follow-up, review of goals, and next steps. Now, um, I noticed that we're allocating 60 minutes to this discussion. Um, we don't necessarily have to go the full 60 minutes. Um, uh, we can just see how it plays out. and. Um, conserve our strength for the remainder of what's to come. Um, the first thing I just want to say was, for those of you who are um, able to attend, you know what, a, um, what an enjoyable, and um, I, I thought for myself anyway, very valuable event it was in, in many dimensions. Um, and I really want to thank Floor and um, Michelle Ksepka, and Brian and Nick um, in particular uh, for sort of the, the organizational and implementational um, group. It, it was really nicely done. Um, and uh, for those of you who couldn't make it, um, 
uh, we hope to bring you into the, um, get you into the swing um, through the discussion that, that's to come without necessarily having it take as long as the original discussion um, that we had. Um, so uh, how do you want to proceed? Floor, um, would you like to do the, <laughs> you don't have to, um, but the review of goals. Um, sure. Uh, I I guess I, I guess after the after the meeting uh, that uh, we we thought that we would maybe go around and maybe I'm not understanding this right that we would go around and everybody would like kind of share you know what were the highlights or not highlights but you know what they thought of the meeting concerning the goals or share otherwise I could summer I I sort of wrote the three goals within those categories again. I could do I could do that, uh, or we we were gonna start. Or I don't know if you wanted to start with norms, you know, like there's many ways to go. Or we are gonna start directly with goals. So I, I'm not sure how we. I was. Um, let's. Uh, why not start uh, sort of in start with the with the begin with the ending, um, in a way uh, where we wound up with the with the goals. And, okay. um, and then we can talk about sort of both the next steps and the, some of the different, you know, inflections that people had on goals um, when we talk about next steps, since we want to be kind of inclusive and um, broad minded in our approach. Okay. Is, is that okay with everybody? So what, what we had, it was a, in ed, educational and academic outcomes seemed to be something that was in everybody's mind. It, and within that, we, we said define equity, audit the curriculum or, instru or a curriculum or instructional audit, both, both words were used, a, improving a student achievement, close the gap, a, a learning at every board meeting measure. So I'm, and then I'll synthesize those. Then long-term planning, uh, we talked a lot with the one theme. So closing the gap was the green, uh, the green check uh, in that category. In long-term planning, we had the governance structure, uh, budget, business manager, negotiations, a uh, level of trust, engagement between the union and district, uh, superintendent evaluation. And what got the the biggest amount of support was the governance structure, how we as a board a govern and partner with the superintendent. It's something that we wanted to work on in regards of the book that we read and other input. And then the other within a community engagement is getting community input more often, COVID concerns and safety, building capacity, everyone's voice heard, establish trust. And on, on that one, we decided that, that what got the check was, you know, the COVID concerns and safety. So getting more information out to the community. It, it, we couldn't completely detach from COVID as uh, in, in our goals. As much as we might want to. Yeah. Yeah. As yes. much as we might want to. Yeah. 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 Um, so that part of I mean, I can't remember that we emphasize from our pictures. My my internet is saying that it's unstable, so I'm gonna ask a few kids here to get off. So hold on a minute. Hey. Okay. Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah, my internet is unstable. I apologize. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, we, we caught it. Yeah. And um, I, I have, you know, uh, I don't know, the soccer team and cross country team in my kitchen. So um, it's, it's going around. <laughs> um, Board members, uh, those of you who participated, uh, thank you for that rundown floor of the goals. Um, uh, anything um, that that any of you want to want to add um, that you felt 
ought to be, again, highlighted yeah. or um, brought to the floor. You're good with it? Um, Scott, so, can I uh, go ahead? Right. Sorry. Oh, I I'm sorry. That's okay. My raised hand wasn't working before. I just wonder if tonight it would be possible. It seems like we're so close to really um, identifying and just firming up what our goals are. And then maybe even defining our norms. I feel like um, Jill brought up a really good point at the retreat that there was a lot of process. Um, and there was, I'm wondering if there was so much process that day that we could really now speed along, state our goals, because I would really like the goals to be what drive the admin teams when they come with the budget timeline. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's a reasonable goal for tonight, if we really worked at it and used everything we did from the day to just be really concise and clear. Thanks. Um, I, I see Jonas has his hand up. Jonas, would you like to speak before we um, address Caroline's point? But I, what I wanted to say, I hope kind of addresses Caroline's point. I wanna refer back to what Steven said on Saturday um, about um, equity and that closing the achievement gap um, that, that we see that is that's evident should be that goal, um, that that specific goal. Um, I, and in terms of governance, I think that's that's something that we have to do. Um, and I think that the conversation around that uh, should be about how we execute that. You know, who does that work? Who does that thought leadership and, and how that's structured? Thanks. My recollection on Saturday was that Stephen's number one, number two, and number three goals were all close the achievement gap. Um, do I remember correctly, Stephen? Okay. Um, uh, Kari, I see Kari, uh, please. Um, yeah, so um, I think I feel like there were so many good ideas um, and I'd really like to sit with them and actually look at them on paper before we can really deliberate. Um, I think that, you know, to, to echo Caroline, I think we need to move quickly, but I think we also need to get specific and I'd hate to rush um, the decision since it's so important. Um, one suggestion I have is, and I think I said this at the retreat is, let's not try to take on too much. We, you can see from this meeting alone, we have a lot on our plates and it's hard for us to move through um, even, you know, sort of normal business. So um, in that spirit, there were two, um, two that rose to the top. It was the education quality and the governance structure. Um, I'm suggesting that we break, give those to two different groups to take a look at and come back with specific um, options for goals uh, that we can consider next time. And um, as the chair of the Ed Quality Committee, I would volunteer us to take on the that that set and bring you something next time if possible. Wonderful. Um, I, it sounds like a fine idea to me. Um, Jill? Um, Jill, we can't hear you. Um, is anybody hearing Jill? Oh, yeah, yeah. No? Okay, um, how's that? There, there you go. Yes, yeah. now. Okay, sorry. When my internet cuts out, it lose, I lose control from the computer to the audio, and I have to go back to the phone, which was charging elsewhere. Sorry about that. Um, I was just going to say that process-wise, I don't, I don't personally feel like I have the stamina to dig into the goals in a meaningful way and all of those details at the moment, given all that we have in front of us. And I really wanted to just second Kari's idea that we send that back to some uh, small group work to then bring back. I, I just think it's a little too much, especially without, I, I don't, I thought we were actually going to send some work 
uh, back to the agenda group to try to figure out how we get to the end of this process because we had left it so unfinished. And um, I don't think we're really structurally prepared to dig into those goals um, at this moment. Um, uh, how about the the educational, basically the educational quality goal, the um, the achievement yeah. gap? Um, that that does seem to be a good fit for that committee, which we already have. I agree. Stood up. Um, so, uh, is there a consensus that that goal can go to that committee? Yeah, I'm seeing nods. Um, I'm, I'm seeing thumbs. Um, I'm. <laughs> Very good. Thumbs in the right direction. All right, Kari, um, you've got that one. Um, so, how about how about the um, uh, other goals? Uh, the the idea of having them go to a smaller group for um, further elaboration and development and presentation to the board for approval seems like a, a good way to go. Um, any suggestions as to how we, or I, I see Chris, um, do you have a suggestion as to? Well, I, uh, first I think we'll determine whether or not we're gonna use the um, um, Rice book that we um, read last year uh, that had governance aspects to it, um, whether or not the, the board as a group wants to um, use pieces of it to try and develop a, a, a governance model or not. Um, and then, and then, uh, then, then create a committee. Uh, just kind of find out where the board wants to go with it, and so that the committee, if it's created, has a basis for um, for pr proposing something. So you, you're um, you're calling for creating a um, another committee, a, a separate. I, yeah, I don't think. I, I don't know if there's a, a committee in existence that would deal with the governance issue as part of their usual work. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so shall we then? So let me, let me, let me pose a question. Um, yeah. Does the board as a whole think that we should use the uh, Patrick Rice book and the models discussed in it as a basis for developing and governing a governance model to propose to the board as a whole. Um, as a new board member, I think we need some kind of um, intro or um, a opportunity to hear the bigger discussion about it. I mean, we received it, but there's never been any kind of wading into it. Uh, yeah, uh, Fleur. I, I think I, I would volunteer to summarize that since the leadership team also read it with us and, and we were in the middle of, uh, you know, towards the end of trying to have either a retreat or something together to work in, in, in how to set that up. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with maybe the agenda planning group on, on, on this. That might be a good place for this to mm -hmm. land since we are doing the governing. Any you know setting the agenda and doing and doing that uh, mm -hmm. and a little deeper in sort of present what we presented before to the other board members, but uh, and also you know get Brian more familiar with that and see if it's something that we want to take. I think we also value on it. In, I, I'm not trying to speak for the leadership team, but I felt like we all felt like it was a value for us as a as a whole. I, I think I would agree with her on that, but um, since Brian wasn't at, there as part of it, I think having members of the leadership team who were there uh, in, the, in the ongoing book discussion, discussion should be part of that um, exploration committee as well. Um, just because, you know, Brian may not have the same grounding in the book itself. So the agenda group will, as a, um, as a separate ad hoc add on to its responsibilities, um, we'll deal with the governance question um, before presenting it to the board. Um, correct? Did I hear that, Jonas? 
Um, I believe that group is uh, supposed to meet next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Uh, would it be possible, uh, you know, could we knock out the, you know, the regular agenda piece in about a half an hour and have a, you know, start to have a brief half an hour conversation, you know, including some of the leadership team uh, during the second half mm -hmm. of that meeting to start talking about the book and how we move forward with this? Ryan? Okay. Sorry, my computer, uh, that my cursor got stuck there. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think we could probably, I, I don't know if we'll be able to bang it out in a half an hour, the, the agenda. So we might have to be a longer <laughs> meeting. You know, I, I think it may have to be a longer meeting. That's all uh, for that, that day. I think, you know, as, as long as we can get in some time just to talk about, you know, I think Jill's absolutely right that this is the venue for it. Um, um, you just having some time, you know, and then, you know, maybe schedule another, you know, another hour at some point before the next meeting to, to do a little deeper dive. Okay. Yeah. And I would love to hear more yeah. about it. I know, yeah. uh, I know floor has uh, charts and chart paper and everything else. So I'd love to <laughs> see the chart paper. <laughs> you know what though? I, I don't think that meeting is calendared because uh, right. That would be the 23rd and I'm not seeing it on my calendar. And in fact, Brian, you and I now have a meeting that day. So clearly it wasn't on yours either. Well, um, Jill, that's because uh, we haven't scheduled it. Uh, we haven't scheduled one because there's a two week gap between regular board meetings because September runs long. Uh, so can we- So the next one isn't- So how oh, that, I see. So, yeah. could, so, so with, with that in mind, could we schedule an hour on the- um, on the 30th to talk about the agenda for the, for the meeting on October 7th and spend an hour on the morning of Wednesday, the 23rd, talking about this uh, governance thing. And if we need more time than that, then we'll try and find it before the next meeting. Yeah, Brian and I just have to reschedule that time, but that's do totally doable. I mean, we could, we could find another time um, on I'm the 23rd. I'm sure. No, no, I think that's fine. I, I think it'll be easier for Brian and me to reschedule than otherwise. But I don't see any of these on my calendar going forward. I'm not sure they go out anymore. I think they may be not there. I'm not seeing any of them. Uh, we had one for September Could 9th. Be me. We have we had ones for September 9th, and that was the last one we had. We just haven't put it on the calendar since then. Okay. Yeah, I my, my work schedule is getting busier and busier, so I got to get those blocked in. So if we can, Brian, if somebody can get those sent out so they're blocked, that would be great. Um, did anybody take pictures of all of those um, flip chart sheets we did so we can all look at them? I would just like to see them again. Yeah, I, I have pictures of some, but we have all of the charts with Michelle and she's in the process of putting it. We took oh, a lot of notes. So okay. we have all of the chart paper and I took a picture of the last one. And that's sort of the one that I was trying to run us, uh, uh, run us by. Great. Okay. Yeah. I just need to get my head back into it. I know it was only four days ago, but it feels like a hundred years already. So I just need to see it again. Yeah, too true. Um, so we're good then on the two of the goals that require a special, seem to require a special um, staffing out. Um, what about the third one? Do we need to assign that to a to a group, or are we going to be able to take care of that one um, more directly? I I, I think we didn't want. Oh, Stephen. Yeah, Scott, ahead, I don't Steve. think it's anything we need to to do or plan for. I think it was an acknowledgement that the board is going to have to deal on a continuing basis with COVID, and we're not going to make decisions. We're going to have to um, um, support and respond to questions from the schools. So I, I don't think there's any planning for us. Okay, good. So um, then we have our mission, um, missions. Um, are we good? Any further discussion of board retreat or shall we move on? Um, Caroline. Thanks. I, um, I agree with Stephen. I don't think that the 
COVID and safety one needs a lot, but I would love if we could even just get a sentence of where we, even if we just summed up some of what Stephen just said, like we are committed to um, safety during this time of COVID and supporting administrators um, to support um, the school community's physical and mental safety. Some, something along those lines that really captures what we are trying to say about COVID and safety, um, even just as a way to, to one, walk away with a goal that's articulated and two, to be really clear to our school community, what we see as our responsibility in this, uh, that would be my preference is that we, you know, try to articulate it and then really actually vote on it. Thanks. Um, you're reminding me of something that Kari was talking about during the, the finance committee meeting earlier regarding the, um, the interest in um, the public in another public forum um, on COVID. Um, perhaps it would be uh, an actual demonstration of, um, of concern and um, commitment to hold such a, such a public forum, as opposed to, you know, um, a statement, which is, which is great, but um, I think actually involving people might, um, might be useful as well. Is there some, is there some Appetite for that among board members? Yeah, I'm seeing thumbs. Great. So, um, agenda committee should should have that on its um, radar as well. Yeah, can I can I just uh, interject here, Scott? Yeah, of course. Uh, and I and I and I, I and I appreciate uh, you know, definitely uh, thinking about doing another committee forum. I just want to uh, make sure that uh, I also check in with my leadership team. Uh, because uh, no, they're working extremely hard, uh, and I just want to make sure we don't burn everyone out either. Uh, it's going to be a very uh, challenging year, so I just wanted to put that plug in. Just to, you know, <laughs> I I hear you totally. Yeah, um, burnout is is a is a major concern. <clears throat> um, looking at you, in fact, among others. So, um, are are we good then? Uh, do we have enough to, to go on for, um, to carry this forward? Okay, um, let's move on then, if there's no objection, to the consent agenda, the um, minutes of August 26th and September 2nd. Um, do we have a motion to approve? Jonas moves to, Jonas moves to approve. Second, please. Lindy seconds uh, with um, and Brian has something to say. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say on page 22 of the uh, minutes, my name was misspelled. So I was hoping that uh, someone might uh, just uh, motion to make that amendment. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. No, no worries. It's, it's a lifelong affliction. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dorothy. Um, I, I, uh, uh, on the minutes for September 2nd, where I am quoted about the VS, uh, VSBA funds, I think Lisa didn't hear me right or I mumbled it. It should have been, um, it should have been installments instead of what the word did, that is there. I lost my minutes. I thought I printed them out, but I can't find them. But it, it's in the September 2nd meeting. It says installations, and you're yeah, saying it should, say, it should say installments. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And um, I have one as well that just brought home to me how much I mangled my attempt at explaining um, my, my perspective. Um, in the very first paragraph of the same item, 3.2 VSBA dues, um, my footnote turned into the headline. <laughs> um, I, I, what I meant was from the perspective of board interests rather than interest-based bargaining. 
that's what you picked up on, Stephen. Stephen, look. Um, uh, I was I meant to focus on board interests, which I thought would be familiar from what I don't want to say because then that's what's going to stick in everybody's head. So, any other? Sorry, so Scott, where it says from the perspective of interest-based bargaining, you want that change to from the perspective of board interest? Yes, Lisa, that's that's correct. Um, that's actually, I think that's what I said. And then I went on a riff that I should never have gone on because it just confused things. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other changes to the minutes? on either September 2nd or August 26th. If not, all in favor, please click your yes button. Opposed, click no. And I'm seeing all yeses. Great. Thank you very much. Now, um, for board orders, does anyone happen to have them um, handy? to make the motion. Lindy? I can get unmuted here. Um, <clears throat> I make a motion to approve the board orders in the amounts of $424,937.87 and $795,000 $396.35. That's the two. Wonderful. Thank I you. I make a motion to approve those, I guess that's what I, I meant to say. Those. Yes, thank you. Is there a second? Floor seconds. Thanks. And and Jonas thirds. Great. Um, Lisa, did you get that? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any questions? If there are no questions, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And um, all green. The motion carries unanimously. And we come to personnel um, approving new teachers, resignations, retirements. Um, Let's see, um, this is on page, there, there's a new or a um, revised copy of the, um, of, the, of the agenda. Does anyone have it handy? Um, mine isn't opening properly. I have it right here. Great, Lindy. Do you want me to list each of them or just start for each grouping? I think um, if you if you go through the new teachers first, um, All right. do that one bunch. All right, I make a motion to accept the recommendation of hiring the long-term substitute at Rumney, um, Honey Bean Barrett. Excellent, is there a second? Chris seconds. All right, any discussion? Um, her, uh, her paperwork is at the very end of the, um, of the agenda packet. So if there's no discussion, all in favor, once again, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, so next we have retirements. Um, would anyone like to move the retirements and, and list the retirees? Um, I move that we accept the retirements of Janice Hood, Berlin paraeducator, Jane Boucher, a Berlin teacher, Laura Garin, U32, U32, Food Services employee. 
did that did that come out i i i lost i didn't, I didn't there was hear a last two yeah um the last two okay um laura garen u32 para educator and vicky cook u32 food service employee great okay everybody got that um good uh is there a second diane seconds great uh any discussion? This, as I understand, is all effective at the end of this school year. Is that correct, Brian? That is that is correct. Okay. Um, if there uh, if there is no discussion, all in favor, please click yes. opposed. Click no. And once again, um, the motion carries unanimously. Um, so uh, one, uh, the sad part of this list, um, would anyone care to make the motion? Uh, if no one makes a motion, does it not happen? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> uh, if only. <laughs> Um, I'll reluctantly make the motion to accept Keith McMartin's um, resignation as uh, director, director of um, technology. Thank you, Chris. Um, Lindy, would you second? Re yes. Reluctantly? Okay. Chris moves, Lindy seconds. Um, uh, Brian. Yeah, I, I uh, just want to uh, thank Keith uh, for his service uh, to our district. Uh, especially during the last few months where I've gotten to know him. Uh, he's done uh, outstanding work uh, with uh, you know, get, helping us get our computers and technology set up for set up for our district. We honestly would not have been able to uh, get to where we are right now without his work this past uh, summer and uh, the start of the school year. Uh, and and I, I just want to say that uh, I also want to thank him for uh, you know, also uh, working. Uh, he also did a uh, sign a letter of agreement to help us out up to a certain time. It won't be forever, but if there is an emergency, uh, he will uh, come back and help us. I, you know, we did sign a letter of agreement, so uh, it, it'll have to be, we'd have to give him uh, dual time to come and help us. It, it, there's a time, you know, there is a time where it does expire, but uh, yeah, I think this is gonna be a difficult position to uh, replace. Uh, we, uh, we heard our teachers today talking about technical issues uh, in remote. Um, the, uh, so just so you know, I, I'm going to be posting this pretty short, pretty uh, putting this out there very quickly, um, and we may have to not just post locally, but statewide, regionally, even nationally. I, I, this is going to be, I think, a uh, again, a you know, directors of technologies do not grow on trees. <laughs> so I have to say. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, um, Keith, wherever you are um, in this Zoom. Uh, chessboard, um, thank you very, very much. Um, you know, given given um, where we are right now in terms of our reliance on technology, we cannot understate uh, the value that Keith has been to enabling us to continue with our work almost flawlessly uh, and seamlessly since March. And it just, you know, just his manner and his calmness under uh, fire from every direction has been, uh, just fabulous, and I, I'm going to miss him very much. But Keith, thank you very much for all you've done, uh, and hopefully you'll, you have a bug in the system that will pop up your name every so often. <laughs> Great. Good. There you are, Keith. I am. Yeah. I'm here. Thank you all so much, and I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for the opportunity. It's been. Uh, it's it's been a great experience, and I, you know, I think you'll be in good hands with the team that you know we've put together over the last couple of years. So, and like Brian said, there, we do have a letter. So if uh, worst comes to worst, I, I can always uh, come back for an assist if need be. So, um, thank you. That makes us feel about this much better. <laughs> We wish you the very, very best, Keith. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, are you ready to vote on it?
All, <laughs> I saw that floor. <laughs> um, all in favor, please, however reluctantly, please click yes. And uh, opposed, um, you have to be really cruel in order to click no. So um, I'm seeing all yeses. Um, the motion carries then. Uh, we'll miss you, Keith. Thank you. Okay, is that on um, personnel? If that's the case, then we have our traditional round two of public comments towards the end of the meeting. Um, it's up, uh, we have, um, is that Corinne Stradsberg's number? Am I beginning to recognize it now? Corinne? Yes. You do recognize it now. Um, two quick items. With all the budget talk, I wanted to just put the reminder out there that I hope you will all keep in mind the feedback after last town meeting as to what information was made available to the public and how it was made available. And then the second item I had brought up before COVID started, and I'd like to bring it back up for a future agenda, that U32 opened in 71 and graduated its first class in 72. And I certainly hope there will be some recognition and celebration of that occasion. And that's it. Thank you, Corinne. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> budget information and, and the 50th anniversary of the first graduating class of U32. That is an occasion I hope will be um, marked and, and celebrated as um, in the way that we were once accustomed to doing. Um, are there any other um, members of the public who would like to weigh in before we go to executive session? If not, um, I would entertain uh, a motion. Could I just oh, say something? Yeah. In response to what Corinne brought up, because it is too easy to forget, last year as the town reports were being done was the first it became apparent that materials that generally are in town reports weren't going to the towns because of the merging. And I, I am, Brian wasn't here, so he's not aware he wasn't here before to know what had been in those town reports, but it got to the point that right before town meeting, I was asking for those salary reports and things that used to be in the town report to have at town meeting because I was being asked why they weren't in the town report. And I want a conversation with town clerks or of some sort that is not just some tables about our testing results, but actually about our budget and what it goes for and now that we have one budget, how it's affected because I think people are used to having that information. Thank you, Lindy. Yeah, um, that that sounds like a, a like a terrific idea. Can I uh, just uh, just also let, let everyone know? I know uh, I started uh, working with uh, the folks that had worked on last just as of today. I don't think this is related to the report that you're talking about, Lindy. But since we're talking about reports, uh, I know last year there was an annual report to the community about 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 the district. It was like a little booklet that went out. Uh, so I know we're beginning that work but that might be that's not what you're talking about is it lindy that kind of replaced what people were used to and mm -hmm. people felt it was not what they were looking for it was very pretty and it said nice things about our schools and i'm not saying it wasn't a good report but it wasn't the kind of financial report they're used to having in their town reports and is, whether we're merged or not it should I, come I, out. I, so I, th I definitely thought the report was very pretty. I'll tell you the truth. It was really good. Uh, I, I thought that I thought it was uh, professionally done. Uh, and I, you know, and I did see the votes last year. It was a two to one margin. You know, if it's not broke, why fix it? But I, I have to say, if you're say saying that there are other information that may be included or needs to be at least given uh, to, 
to uh, folks before they actually go to the town hall. I guess we can look into what that was. If you have, if, if there's anyone has a, maybe I can ask Lori, but I don't want to put it all on Lori. She's going to be insanely busy. But if anyone wants to send me an idea of what that was or what it looked like, I can start trying to go dig. It's in every town report for the last 50 years. Okay. All right. So that was, <laughs> All right, Lori's here. Lori popped in. I have it. We have a huge checklist. Okay. I think it might be helpful for the finance committee to critique that as part of the budget process. Yeah. So then, okay. because not every form would be the same as a single district as it was as separate districts. Right. It wouldn't be the same, but it could be done as a merged district. Great. Um, first, Dorothy, then Jonas. Um, we're talking about uh new 32 opening in 71 um the callis elementary school um the building that is now there opened also in 1971 they actually moved the students from the three schools in a, i think it was in february sometime i remember moving desks and carrying stuff around and then the first class started in uh, as a whole that September. So um, <coughs> Callis is sort of uh, celebrating as well. <coughs> wow, that, that's, uh, this is a big year coming up. Yeah. Um, Jonas. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to jump in really quickly on the thing about the reports. You know, uh, you know Brian, you may not be familiar with, you know, very familiar with town meeting, what the town report looks like. People are used to getting very dry, you know, black and white data, right, and tables, right? Like Lori, you know, is so good at putting together. I think there's, I think there's room for a glossy, slick, you know, you know, publication, pamphlet, literature, whatever. Um, but that, I mean, remember that town meeting, right? That the the town meeting is is a government body, right? It is a political body, and it's there. People are used to getting, you know, that really, you know government style packaging. <laughs> Quite right. And and there's still a lot of hard headed Yankees around who um, appreciate that. So um, how about a motion to go into executive session for a student matter? Hello. Uh, sorry, uh, Chris, was that you? Yes. Okay, so moved, floor seconds. Again, we invite Brian and Stephen. Wait, um, we're yeah. we're we, we are scheduled to go into executive session for a student matter, um, but I think we should also we make a motion that we are that we are also going into executive session to discuss an employee matter. Correct. And, Good. And yeah. um, right, yeah, the mm -hmm. action will only be on the student matter, but we will discuss uh, personnel. Um. Uh, and Brian, um, Flora suggested. As of right now, I would just bring me in and uh, we can talk about it. Okay, so um, the board plus Brian, Keith. I um, ask a point oh. of order. I mean, you know, this is where I'm, I don't um, know procedurally, um, but if the board requests that Stephen be part of it, is that something we have the right to request? Or is it something that we don't have the right to request? Uh, I do not believe that you have the right to request it. That's a that's a I'm the uh, only employee of the board. Okay. Um, I I would push back on that. I'd say we can invite in whomever we want to come into the executive session, and it's not a um, you know it's, mm -hmm. I think that's a board determination because it's our meeting, mm -hmm. uh, and Stephen's also an employee. Uh, You're an employee of the district. Mm -hmm. We hire yeah. you. You're an employee of the district. Yeah. So I would I would just say please be careful because you could be creating an, an additional personnel matter. I'm not a legal matter. So I would be uh, I would warn you that this could become more big. You you could be overstepping. I'm Brian. I'm just saying yeah. establishing yep. that it's the board's prerogative, not not mm -hmm. uh, the superintendent's. We can invite in whomever we want, whether we choose to do so or not, is another matter. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I, my um, my understanding is that that Chris is actually correct about this, but I would, um, given what what Brian is saying, I think is a matter of just um, proceeding uh, with all due caution. That let's enter this one um, just with Brian, 
and then we can um, make we can figure out from there. So, um, Keith, let, let's just do what? board uh, board plus Brian. Jones. Don't, don't, Scott, that's... Scott, are you making that determination yourself? I, I I'm suggesting it. Uh, do you want to do you want to have a discussion about it? Or... I yes, I sure would. Okay. Um, the, it almost sounds like we have to have that in executive session. I think we might have to have it in executive session. That's the thing. Um, how about if we if we go into executive session with Brian, just with Brian, and then we can just proceed from there. But um, ask Stephen to hang on. I beg your pardon, Chris? But ask Stephen to hang on. Um, yeah, I think he would anyway. Okay, I don't um, know. He's a, he's a, um, yeah, he's a tough one. Okay, um, so Keith, board plus Brian, please, into executive session. Thank you. Scott, do you need a motion and a second for that? Or oh, that I last, yeah. I um, we should have voted. Okay. Um, I, I, I lost my place, apologies. So all in favor of- and, Sorry, um, a second? Uh, Jonas. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Okay, um, all in favor of going into executive session, please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. And okay, now thank you, Lisa, for keeping me honest. Um, so now, Keith, now it's okay. <laughs>